This video is brought to you in part by Squarespace. Yeah, you're probably pretty familiar with that name by now on this channel, and that's no surprise. I love working with these guys, and I love their program. Long and short of it, if you're trying to get yourself a website online, Squarespace are the people you want to work with. I've personally always been intimidated at the idea of even starting a website, but these guys got me up and going within half an hour. I spend more time on character creators and video games. It takes you just a handful of minutes to get the basics, and they walk you through everything, no matter how intricate you want to get. They have a ton of preset designs that you can just get up and going at your heart's content and it all looks super professional. And for those of you who want to get a little bit more bold and creative, you can go behind the curtains and tweak every little thing to your heart's content. If you're trying to put together a shop, portfolio, or whatever, they have tools that can track your growth, help you build an ad campaign, integrate with other social media platforms, and again, all of that is streamlined and easy to understand. It takes very little effort to get something clean and professional up in front of the world. Having your own domain name looks so super sexy on a business card. And to make it even easier, if you head over to squarespace.com slash game apologist, you will get 10% off your first purchase. Seriously, you could get this done in the time it takes you to watch this video. Thank you again to Squarespace for helping out and on with the show. I'm Nick, and this is The Game Apologist, where we look for the good and bad games. But what exactly is a bad game? I mean, it'd be easy enough to hop on a Metacritic, pick the lowest scoring games and just go from there, but what about those critically panned games that still found a loyal fan base? The underrated, the underselling, and the overlooked? Or what about games that were loved by critics but generally despised by everybody else? Those overrated games, or those million selling titles that took the world by storm but are still generally despised by the internet's echo chamber? What about those spin-offs or sequels that, while fine on their own, just don't compare to the rest of a series? I mean, it's also subjective, I don't know where to start. And we have to start somewhere, it's our first episode. We need to go big, bigger than any one game. A game series, an important one. A franchise that's left its mark in gaming history. But that's impossible. What franchise could have some of the most important titles in game history and some of the most notorious? What game series could be so divisive, so all over the place in quality and still somehow exist today? Yep, our mated voyage sets off on the prickly blue sea that is Sonic the Hedgehog. I mean, where else was I supposed to start? The term game apologist is almost synonymous with the spiky speed rat. But what exactly is a Sonic? Well, let's do a quick overview. Sonic is a blue hedgehog known for running really, really fast. He collects, uh, jewelry. This jewelry keeps him alive. He can roll, spin, and jump, and all kinds of ball stuff. This ball kills robots. These robots have stuff inside of them. Mostly animals, but contents may vary. Sometimes his friends show up to do the same thing he does, but kinda differently. Or fish. We'll get to that. They fight this weird old guy who kinda looks like an egg. He's called Eggman, or Robotnik. Adults have fights about this. He stuffs these critters into the machines, and that's no good. But you probably already know that. There's a good chance that even if you've never touched a gamepad in your life, you know this. Sonic was, and to a certain extent, still is, everywhere. Comic books, TV shows, a movie's in the works, God help us all. But Sonic was, and is, first and foremost, a video game character. Hell, a gaming icon. This was the one game series that could take on the Tyrant King Mario in an industry ruled by Nintendo. And if you weren't around or didn't pay any attention to this nonsense, it might be hard to imagine Nintendo ruling all things video games when you look at what they are today. Just think of recent victories like Pokemon Go or the Nintendo Wii a few years back. Nintendo is no stranger to completely dominating a market. And back then, they didn't have the likes of Microsoft, Sony, or mobile phones to worry about. Hell, even Sega themselves won a full decade of attempting to topple the Great Mustachio Beast before they found any success in everyone's favorite cactus creature. It's easy to forget unless you live through the era, but the Sega Genesis was out a full two years before the Super Nintendo, and it was still getting trounced by the original Nintendo. I'm sure I wasn't the only kid who never even heard of a Genesis until Sonic came packed in with the machine. And while Sega and Sonic never quite got to Nintendo levels of popularity, they sure as hell gave them a run for their money. Almost overnight, this company went from, what the hell's a Master System, to, oh, Sega Genesis. Of course I have a Genesis. Of course I play Sonic. Are you still playing Mario? What fun blowing into your cartridges so you can play your crappy little VCR machine and crawl through sewer pipes with your flubby chub boy, you stupid nerd. Sonic was the first video game character featured in Macy's Thanksgiving Day Parade. That didn't, didn't go well. Did not, oh boy. That's a, a child scarred for life. He had two cartoons running at the same time started a comic series that's still running today. 
had toys, Happy Meal tie-ins, even a Zone SpaghettiOs. Those things are horrible. How how are those still on shelves? Those are the worst. Sonic was so big that he was on track to becoming more recognizable than Mickey Mouse. So what happened? Well, like Sonic's many zones, his games have been on a bit of a roller coaster in terms of quality. Sega is notorious for making bold but ultimately foolish decisions. Bold but messy can be seen everywhere in their flagship franchise, and it's been like this for a long time, leaving many to wonder if Sonic's worth keeping around, or if he was ever any good to begin with. I think we're at the Real point talk. where we need to admit that this was never really a great franchise, nope. and that we, they, we keep trying and trying and trying to find this thing that was never really actually no, there. Sonic was never good. Yeah, it's it been was a 25-year like... lie. <laughs> yes. <laughs> This is GameScoop, a gaming news podcast found on IGN, the world's largest gaming website. This is how they presented the announcement of a new Sonic game. Now before I go any further, if you haven't figured it out by now, I like Sonic. Hell, I love this series. I've been playing these games the entire quarter century they've been around. You could say I'm a fan. Or a blue, I guess? Huffington Post? Alright. The point is, I am a Sonic fan. And as a Sonic fan, there's nothing I hate more than Sonic fans. That statement is probably not as uncommon as you might think. We are notorious for being downright cannibalistic. I like the original games, and if anything else came after that, it's just pure trash. Well, I jumped on on the Sonic Adventure games, so everything old is just old garbage, and you're an old man, and you're dumb. Well, maybe you don't like any of the games. Maybe you just like the cartoon that came out at the same time. Oh, but that's not canon. I don't even like that cartoon. I like the other cartoon. That was the funny one. With the... <laughs> the way we talk to each other, it makes you wonder if we even like Sonic. Hey, uh, does, uh, does anybody want a chili dog? You, Sonic, why don't you eat my chili dog? We'll hate you if you hate Sonic. We'll hate you if you like Sonic. We'll hate you if you're Sonic. And that's not even getting into the weird stuff that it. Uh, <laughs> Look, I'm not here to shame anybody's particular fetish. I'd like to just enjoy something without people also thinking I want to have sex with it while I wear its skin. We may be referred to as blues, but I promise you this is quite a colorful community. And that was a bad joke, and I'm, I'm not ashamed. But no matter how dysfunctional this family may be, it is still a family. Meaning we only allow smack talk amongst each other. The moment an outside force berates the games or the fan base, the divided house of blues unites to unleash a torrent of rage towards the offender. So as you can imagine, this GameScoop clip got a lot of the fan base pretty heated. The YouTube clip got downvoted into oblivion. The sheer amount of video responses are, ooh. They even made a petition to make iChain apologize. Oh boy, oh boy, look at all this. And just look at these responses. iGen hates Sonic. iGen exposed. All right, look, uh, uh, fellow blues, I have to play iGen apologist for a second here. After all this stuff I read online about how their reviews are paid off by gaming companies, it's nice to hear these guys express their own opinions. And these are just opinions. And opinions different from yours are a good thing. It's good to expose yourself to people you don't agree with. Even if these are sometimes just cheap jabs. Also, yeah. the reason is they all want to have sex with Big the Cat. That's true. <laughs> that is still the reason. No, look, I, I said think... it an hour ago. I'll say it again. <laughs> cat sex. That's, that's real clever professional games journalist. It's fine. He's clearly joking terribly but he's joking so it's whatever no, no reimagine yeah it's Remix totally gonna be like you're going through re, uh green hill zone from oh. sonic 2 and you're like this is familiar all right fine look all right it's easy to mistake green hill and emerald hill it's just another shade of green you haven't played the games in a while i can understand if you haven't it was like they, they re-released like ecto cooler this year and we're like hell yeah brings me back to middle school and i went and i drank it and i'm like this is not that great and i was like maybe it never was that great maybe it's just Green water. I mean, that would make sense if the original Sonic games were just gone for 20 years, but they've been on every single platform. I mean, I could just pull out my phone and download it and it plays just fine. I mean, it's just a little- So people seemed uh, excited about this Sonic Mania announcement, yeah. but I don't know, people seem to have forgotten that uh, not too long ago, there was Sonic the Hedgehog 4. Yep. It was re released episodically. It had two episodes. Yeah, and I think it was pretty yeah. mediocre. <sighs> No, we didn't forget about Sonic 4, or your site's review for Sonic 4. We were the ones who pointed out the flaws your company seemed to gloss over. We're excited for Sonic Mania because, unlike you, we've done a little research. We know who's making the game. They've proven themselves talented. They've proven themselves with Sonic. They clearly understand how they- Sonic 1 is a non-issue. It's just, it's a terrible game. Sonic 2, I think, is, and Sonic & Knuckles have redeem, redeemable aspects. Within five years of those games, you could play Sonic 2 and you could play Super Mario World in the same afternoon, and you realize which one aged better. And you fast forward now, 20 something 30 whatever how long it's been um yeah super mario has just aged better like it just oh, yeah, always has sure. many retro games have um it just it just never was that great 
you know what? Your classic games you love so much, not that good either. Halo is just a long hallway and three kinds of enemies. Resident Evil 2? It's unplayable. It's unplayable then, it's unplayable now. It's just garbage tank controls. It just adds to the horror. They don't understand 3D movement, you idiots. Same crap with Tomb Raider. You have to do acrobatics with tank controls? Are you out of your mind? They had to reboot this stupid thing twice. Castlevania is stiff and frustrating. Difficulties there just to plot out the game times. Crap. Ew, the Symphony of the Night says, where am I going? Why is, I've been in the same room literally 20 times. How is this fun? Who builds castles like this? Oh boy, I'm gonna go through all the same crap, but upside down. Oh, Mega Man, why don't we get more Mega Man? You're just not good at the games. You don't understand. I'm sorry. I don't enjoy being mad as hell for six games straight until Stockholm Syndrome kicks in. Oh, but Mario, you say? Mario is perfect. Best game series ever made. Sonic was never as good as Mario World. Mario World's kind of boring. Yeah, I said it. We're all thinking it, but nobody wants to say it. It's not even as good as Mario 3. Hey, how do you make dinosaurs lame? You give it to Mario. That lame-ass dinosaur goes and makes an even better game. Mario World's not even the best in its own series. Over the game's perfected, it's you find It's safe. It's boring, safe, vanilla, garbage nonsense. Did you even do anything? Look at this game. It's all plain bubbly baby bullshit with this stupid lullaby soundtrack that's trying to put you to sleep. No, don't even start with me. Classic soundtrack, my ass. This sounded ridiculous back then. Why do you think it went and got a Genesis? This looks like play school baby crap. It's just like five different tracks and five different backgrounds and call yourselves game journalists couldn't play your way out of a paper bag. All right, so I'm a bit of a hypocrite. Sonic fan, remember? Now, Mario fans, put down your pitchforks and fire flowers. I love Mario World fine, but there are personal preferences I have against the game. Can I look past them? Yeah, of course. It all comes down to personal taste. But going forward, even though we're going to be talking about the good and bad games, I'm also not going to pretend there isn't bad and good games, as minuscule as they may be. Perfection is different for everybody. As much as I love the games I griped about, there are issues. I didn't like the way Resident Evil's or Tomb Raider's played back then, and I certainly don't now, and that's fine. They're still important. They're still cherished for very understandable reasons. I'll admit, I did get annoyed listening to these guys talk in this clip. It's pretentious, it's unprofessional, and it's uninformed. And I kinda love it. See, this is the kind of crap we would argue about back when Sonic and Mario were the go-to guys for your gaming system of choice. I'm sure at least a couple of these guys got into arguments on the playground, talking about their dumb baby games starring their badly dressed Flubby Boy, while everyone else was playing their super hip, colorful cartoon animal on the other electronic toy machine. I mean, granted, Sega's electric toy machine was slick and sexy and black, and Nintendo's looked like a cinder block made by PlaySchool, but that's besides the point. I have to admit, I love that after all this time, we're still wanting to punch each other in the face over this point. Pointless crap. I just wish it wasn't so shameful to be a Sonic fan these days. Video games and gamers still have a bit of a stigma to them. And within that circle, Sonic fans are considered some of the worst. You say you like Sonic and nobody's gonna take you seriously. And the problem with this clip is nobody's arguing with them. It's just four guys goading each other on. It's kind of alarming that Sonic, a gaming icon, someone that helped define childhoods, can't find any love in this room. And even if there was somebody who loved Sonic on there, they'd probably be ashamed to admit it. Nobody would take him seriously. And it's not like this is the first time this opinion's been shared. Amongst these guys are other game journalists. Here is my hypothesis. Yes. Sonic the Hedgehog is the most overrated game ever. Hey, you know what sucks? Sonic the Hedgehog. Yeah, I'm sorry, internet. It's true. Everything that comes out of a blue hedgehog is balls. He said we're 100% of every thing that comes from Sonic. Yeah. <laughs> yep. <laughs> <laughs> Sonic sucks. Look, Sonic fans, we can get as mad as we want. You can blame media bias. You can say they're playing the games wrong. Games, again, I remind you, made for children to easily understand. You can get mad at me for sharing my thoughts or other fans for liking certain games over others or how you don't like the color of Sonic's eyes. But really, we should be a little miffed at Sega. Once upon a time, this was a company that gave us a plethora of quality games of all kinds. But over the years, they've whittled it down to just, well, mostly Sonic. And they can't even treat him right most of the time. Nintendo may play it safe from time to time with Mario, but they still understand what that name means to the industry, and they treat it with the care and respect it deserves. And when they get bold and try something new, the little plumber changes the industry entirely. Sega, on the other hand, will just slap Sonic onto anything just to get sales, even if the game is broken, far from ready, or just a stupid idea that should have gotten people fired the moment it was pitched. And they've been doing this crap for the good majority of Sonic's existence. They've perfected the core gameplay of the Hedgehog once. Once. And yes, they've had a lot of good games since then, but every time they're working towards something truly special, they just go flying off into a bottomless pit and... Right? Where is the ground in this world? You remember when Sega followed arguably their best Sonic game with absolutely nothing? You remember how the Sega Saturn launched with no core Sonic titles? Or how about his rough transition into 3D? Or his other rough transition into 3D? Or his other rough transition into 3D? You remember when they made you fish? 
Hmm, you remember how they took Sonic's controls in Sonic Adventure, one of the few things that holds up well today, and made it progressively worse in each passing game? You remember when they gave him a sword? Or when they gave Shadow a gun? Oh, hey, you remember Shadow? OC Do Not Steal Prime? How about the Werehogs, the races, the party games? You remember when they put four in their title? Do you? This game that had the gall to say it stood among the classics? You remember how they recaptured the magic by adding homing attacks? Made everything plastic? And that amazing soundtrack? What is, what is this noise? Why are my ears bleeding? Do you remember 2006? You remember when they released Sonic the Hedgehog? You remember this rushed, broken game they charged $60 for? The game they had the balls to share the same name as the original? One of the most important games of all gaming history? That shares the name with this thing? And in the same year, they went and screwed up the original game! Yeah, they released a game that was 15 years old at this point on the Game Boy Advance, and it ran like crap! How is that alright to do? And it's no problem with the Game Boy. One fan went and fixed the game with a ROM hack just to prove they could do it. One fan! On his computer! Computer for free! Fix a crappy port an entire team was paid to create! It's absolutely ridiculous! And in between all these stupid buggy games, the only decent thing that came out of Sonic around that time was when they lent him to Nintendo! Oh my god! Oh, but that was 10 years ago, you say? It's not as bad as the internet says, you say? Am I the only one who likes Sonic 06? You write in your YouTube comments, and yes, yes you are, and shame on you! 10 years ago, fine, but what about Sonic Boom in 2014? How many chances are we gonna give these people? And no, I don't care if it's for kids. They deserve better than this. Look, I know they've made good, even great games in between all these messes, but I shouldn't have to wait for every five year anniversary just to play a good Sonic game. And yes, the upcoming stuff looks great, but be honest with yourself, Sonic fans. Really honest with yourselves. How many of you are still worried that Sonic game's gonna screw something up before these things are released? And even if these games are good, how do we know they'll stay good? There's no consistency here. How is it okay for Sega to disrespect their flagship franchise, but not a few IGN editors? Sonic has not been a go-to brand for guaranteed quality for a very long time, but he's still invited to the party that is video games, even if all he does is get drunk and squeeze out a spiky blue turd on the dance floor. And sure, he's sobered up for the most part, but one drink too many and drops his pants in Sonic Boom all over the place. He still shows up on a guest list that no longer invites the likes of Clonoa, Gex, Conker, Banjo-Kazooie, and probably anything from Konami. Hell, even Sega's own Alex Kidd, Echo, Knights, Rystar, anyone from Jet Set Radio, Skies of Arcadia, countless others. But the blue guy's still here making an ass of himself. And why is he still here? Why are we still here? Why do we cling on to a series and a character that desperately needs to be put down? Why are we part of a fan base so disjointed that we get in fights with each other just as often as we do with people who hate the hedgehog? Why do we keep giving money to people who clearly have no idea what they're doing? Well, that's what we're here to find out. Are things as dire as they seem? Do we really have more bad Sonic games than we do good? And are the bad ones quite as bad as we've been told? Is the fanbase as poisonous and perverted as it's made out to be? And was Sonic ever good to begin with? When I was coming up for the premise of the show, I knew I would have to cover the bare belly blue beast at some point. That was a given. But I didn't think I'd have to cover the original games. I mean, those are classics. Those are some of the most important games ever made. I've always been under the impression those have widely been regarded as such. This is a show about finding the good and bad, notorious, or simply overlooked games. The original Sonic games are far from any of those categories. But if people, especially professional games journalists, are asking if these were ever any good, well, I think it's about time we answered. 25 years of a long, complicated history is a lot to weed through. Obviously, we can't cover every single game or comic or cartoon in one video. I mean, look how long it took me just to get to this point. To truly understand what made this series so impactful and why it still matters, you have to start from the beginning. So, for the first episode of The Game Apologist, we will be covering Sonic the Hedgehog for the Sega Genesis. But first, we have to ask, how and why did Sega create the Speedy Smurf? Well, put simply, a desperate need for identity. Sega needed a face for their company something that would directly compete with Nintendo's Mario, something that would speak to a new generation and a new decade still growing into its own identity, that of the 90s. So they held a company-wide contest to design said mascot, and after sifting through many ideas, they finally settled on a rat. And that's it. They made no changes whatsoever and settled on this one design. And that's how you have Sonic the Hedgehog. Okay, obviously, there's a lot more to this, but you could read entire books or watch countless YouTube videos on the subject, and, I mean, go right ahead if you're interested. We only have so much time to cover this stuff, because things get crazy real quick, so let's just cut to some of the key points. Now, depending on who you talk to, a good number of people had their hands in his creation. This was a character created market of brand, after all. But two names that will pop up most often are going to be Naoto Oishima for designing the blue blip. The blue blip. Blip blip. The blue, the blue blur. Blue blur. And Yuji Naka lead programmer of the first game. But just keep in mind, there's a lot of talented people that made this thing happen. 
Anyway, before we get into the game itself, I think it's important to look at Sonic, the character. Now, if you watch videos like these, you may have run across Bob Chipman's Game Overthinker. A few years back, he tackled the topic of Sonic and his design, which he described as a punk rock Mickey Mouse. And I, I mean, well, look at him. That's that, that's exactly what this is. Man, it's kind of brilliant. Walt Disney and his company kind of have this whole memorable, timeless thing on lockdown. Sega followed suit with Sonic and pumped it full of contemporary 90s attitude, but they somehow did it without making it embarrassingly dated. But how do you do that? How do you make something both contemporary and timeless? Well, let's quickly compare Mickey and Sonic and see what they have in common. Both were preceded by rabbits, not really important, but kind of weird. Both have very strange ideas for what counts as outdoor clothing. Both have very simple color palettes, four, five at the max. And Sonic in particular is well known for his blue quills. This both represents Sega, and at least for the time, was a very standout color to slap onto an animal, even a fictional one. Both are fairly uncommon animals in media. Cartoon mice may be a bit more mainstream now, but you'll find few before Mickey. And you're not going to be thinking of Jerry or Stuart Little before him. As for Sonic, well, just speaking out of personal experience, I had no idea what a hedgehog was before he came around. I was five and didn't have internet. Give me a break. Still, no matter how familiar you may be with hedgehogs or mice, when you think of these creatures, you're likely going to be thinking of these characters. They practically have a monopoly on the represented living species. And really, they deviate away from the real animal as much as possible, putting in just enough to get in away with calling them a mouse or a hedgehog. Both have very similar proportions and designs. Sonic is very clearly designed in the same style as Mickey or Felix the cat. Even Sonic's weird cyclops eye is kind of reminiscent of Mickey's older design before they put skin on his face. When you break both of these characters down to their most basic shapes, you still know who those shapes belong to. Those iconic mouse ears and that iconic buzzsaw head. I hear constantly that Sonic is everything wrong with the 90s. The personification of the decade. You can tell me he's the most 90s thing in the world until you're as blue as he is. You can hate this character and his design, but it doesn't change the fact that you know exactly who those quills belong to the moment you see them. That's what I mean when I say Sega understood what made characters like Mickey so timeless. The Hedgehog's design is simple, but instantly recognizable. So what makes Sonic such a 90s character? Could it be those bright red shoes? I and mean, they're the same color as a sports car, and I feel like the 90s were a bit more obsessed with them than they are now, but that color has always been synonymous with speed. I mean, that hasn't changed. Sonic's shoes don't have air pumps, loose shoelaces, or light-up heels. It's not even a specific brand. I mean, that would just stink the character. <laughs> well, anyway, the original shoes are, like Sonic, kept nice and simple. Could it be that iconic blue color? I mean, the 90s was in love with this color, at least in terms of junk food. Blue M&Ms, blue Fruit Loops, blue hedgehogs. So I can kind of see that, but I think this works with the design. Makes him stand out, sure, but it goes with the red and the white he's wearing on his shoes. And those colors don't go out of style, right? Maybe it just comes down to the quills, the sharp angles, much more aggressive than the likes of Mickey or Mario. I mean, maybe, but they're not too aggressive. They're still on a small woodland critter. He still looks friendly and unmistakably the hero of his story. The shoes, the color of the quills, these are all little things that help deviate away from the cartoons of old. And yes, these are certainly design choices reminiscent of the 90s, but they didn't put them in sunglasses or a backwards baseball cap. The thing about being cool is you can't actually try to be cool. It has to look natural, effortless. Sonic did just that. Again, when you cram in later games or the cartoons, yeah, it, he's a bit of a tryhard. But just in terms of his first game, there is no denying that this little dude had some style. He's not a poochie. Nothing about this design dates the character. I don't think that's why people call Sonic dated. I think it comes down to that smirk. 90s was all about attitude and Sonic was chock full of it. If you saw any of the cartoons, read the comics, or watched those commercials, yeah, 90s is all get out. But come on, how many of you still think Mario is a plumber from Brooklyn thanks to Captain Lou Albano? All this media is important to the franchise, and we'll get to it at another time. But for now, let's stick to the games. Here, Sonic's attitude isn't quite so overbearing, but he still has a lot of sass in that little sprite. I mean, right at the title, he does that little finger wave, which... I I, I, don't, I don't know what that means. I, I never have. I always thought that was kind of stupid. But it gives you the impression of confidence. He looks like he's ready for the challenges ahead. Question is whether or not you can keep up. And once you pop into the game proper, you can understand why they went with the crazy Cyclops eye. Sonic Sprite is far more expressive than what came before. He looks worried about falling off ledges, shows some stress while pushing heavy objects, gets impatient when you leave Mydle. It's not much in today's standards, but again, look at the gaming heroes prior to his existence. Eh, exciting stuff. Not only do I feel that whatever 90s elements are there have aged just fine, they also work wonderfully with that signature speed. 90s or not, this dude looks fast. And he certainly is. To help push the one advantage the Sega Genesis had over the more powerful Super Nintendo, the processing speed, they made this little sucker quick as the dickens. But none of this, the speed, the design, the attitude, none of this would mean anything unless you had a good game to show all this off. Or was it just different enough from what we had at the time? Was it both? Well. Here we finally are, the game itself. So we understand what made Sonic stand out from the crowd in terms of character design, but what about game design? 
How do you make a name for yourself in a genre already perfected by the likes of Mario and Mega Man? Well, you add loop-de-loops. But no, seriously. Let's take a look at Green Hill Zone. So obviously the graphical upgrade is just insane. And they were clearly proud of it too, boldly comparing it to Super Mario World. And I can't blame them. The screen is much busier, but this makes Mario World look dreadfully bland in comparison. Green Hill's vegetation, like Sonic himself, has that aggressive yet inviting feel to it. Sharp, triangular petals that look like they could take your eye out. Unlike Mario's Mushroom Kingdom, where everything literally has eyes and a smiley face on it. Also, not foreboding like the environments in Castlevania or Metroid. Green Hill still looks colorful. It looks like an absolute blast to run through. And it absolutely is. See, Green Hill is not so much a level as much as it is a playground. Best way I could describe it is like, well, I guess it depends on your own personal gaming history, but to anybody who grew up with a PlayStation or N64, this feels a lot like the first time you got your hands on the warehouse level of Tony Hawk's Pro Skater. Eh, Tony, I wish this would be the last time your games show up on this show, but back to that another time. Back to Sonic. This is essentially a digital skate park before the days of Pro Skater. It does what every good starting level should do, teach you how the mechanics work without dragging you down in stupid tutorials. It's a lot of fun to just run around and explore. You learn very quickly that Sonic is so unlike anything else we have played before in a platformer. Green Hill has multiple ways to make it to the goal, and you could backtrack as you pleased. The timer went up and set it down. You could use that as a way of saying take your time, have fun, or as a means to see how fast you could zip through a level. The little collectibles were rings instead of coins, and also acted as your life bar. As long as you could keep a hold of one, you could survive attacks. A very clever mechanic for its time, and still mostly unique to the Hedgehog even today. This paired well with Sonic's ridiculous speed, allowing you to get a little reckless. The world wasn't made up of blocks. It had uneven terrain, hills, loops, ramps. The world required you to take advantage of Sonic's momentum. You didn't have to hold down a button to get him running either. All you'd ever need is a single button in the directional pad. Knockout and his team wanted to make controls for Sonic as simple as possible. And it all works well together, because Sonic was, most importantly, a lot of fun to play. And Green Hill, despite the hazards, was an absolute blast to roll around in. Then you get to Marble Zone and the rest of the game, and you did it. What, you, you thought there was more? Why spend so much time on Green Hill and not the rest of the game? Good question! You could ask the developers the same thing! Let's tackle one of the biggest complaints about this game. One that many people feel plagues the entire Sonic series. The first level is much better than the rest of the game. Now, I personally feel that's simply not true in future titles. But in the first game? Y yeah, the, the complaint's valid. Yuji Naka himself practically said so. Said they spent more time on Green Hill than any other part of the game. Since this would be the world's introduction to the Hedgehog, they wanted to make a strong impression and took extra care on the opening zone. And yes, it shows. Marble Zone throws all the fun of Green Hill out the window and everything slows to a crawl. Spring Air goes back to crazy speed, but feels a lot less polished. And also, I just, what's going on here? I feel like they were trying for a Vegas casino, but it feels less Vegas and more Lake Tahoe on lots and lots of trucks. And then there's Labyrinth Zone. When you hear complaints about this game, a good majority of them lie within the zone's unforgiving deaths. Not only does it have cheap shot bad guys right up front, not only does your character move in literal slow motion a good chunk of the time, not only does the level geometry work against the sluggish movement, and not only does it introduce a breathing mechanic, if getting the hedgehog oxygen wasn't bad enough, they also introduced this music scene that was so stressful that your heart is probably racing a little faster right now, giving it this sense of urgency, wondering why I'm not rushing through these sentences even though I have no real need. And then there's Starlight and who cares. One of the most unremarkable levels of all the classic Sonic games. You can't kill any of the enemies, these stupid little fans are here just to waste your time, and you literally have to smack into parts of the level just to proceed. Best thing about it is the music, and doesn't fit anything happening on the screen. Whole thing feels unfinished. Oh, and would you look at that motif, what a surprise. Then there's Scrap Brain. This level pulls no punches. Which is fine, it's the last level of the game, it's gonna be hard, and oh no, why? Now if you survived all this, and lucked your way through the special stages to grab all those Chaos Emeralds, you get the good ending, spoilers, sounds like the game falls apart right after that lovely jungle gym of Green Hill, when put in this context. But I disagree. While I don't believe that games are excused from criticism just for being older, I do believe that when they were released is still a conversation that needs to be had. Sonic was the first in its series. Like many other games that kick off a franchise, rarely is the first one perfect. Look at Mario and Mega Man. Sure, they had sequels out by the time Sonic rolled in, sequels that helped solidify the ground rules of what makes a stellar platformer. Sonic, as I stated earlier, certainly had to take notes from those games, but had to try something new if he had any chance of standing out from the crowd. The first Sonic game is very experimental and a little rushed in spots. A common theme will be seen in this game series, but I digress. 
Green Hill, as refined as it is compared to the rest of the game, feels, like I said, experimental. This was a new way to play a platformer, and here you can see where the developers were getting the best idea of what made Sonic work so well. The rest of the game feels like it's dipping its toes into other ideas just to see how well they played out. Marvel tried slower, more traditional platforming. Might have slowed things down, but I don't see why that's a negative. It's still a well-designed level. Labyrinth played around with a water mechanic? And say what you will about the zone, certainly was a unique way to tackle the element in a medium that, up to that point, never really made it a whole lot of fun. And that stressful drowning jingle? You may not like it, but you sure as hell won't be forgetting it anytime soon. Might have helped teach kids that staying underwater for extended periods of time isn't exactly a good idea. Unlike Mario. Oh yeah, swimming's a snap. Don't have to worry about underwater pressure or that silly breathing thing. Fire? Not a problem. This guy. Calm down, Nintendo fans. The games are great. Just pointing out that Mario drowns children. That's all I'm saying. And while I will admit that these zones can't overstay their welcome, this game really doesn't take that long to beat. Even if it's your first time with the game, it really won't take you long to come to terms with the playstyle. Hell, you could have beat this game faster than it takes to sit through this video. And if you find it too short, well, that's what the special zones are for. They help break up the levels, give you a little more of a challenge for yourself by not only surviving a stage, but surviving with at least 50 rings. And while I agree with critics that there is a bit of luck involved with the special zones, it's nowhere near as out of control as you would be led to believe. You can still make Sonic jump whenever you want, you still have control of where he leaps off to, and you have all these switches that come to your advantage and help you literally control the stage, as long as you're paying attention. They're really not that difficult once you come to grips with this. And even if you don't want to bother, just skip them. Won't take away from the core game experience. What, you get a bad ending? Oh well. When this game came out, there was a very good chance that you had this and only this to keep you entertained. And if you rented the game, chances are you'd have it beaten in an afternoon. But if you loved the game and really wanted more out of your purchase, the Special Zones were there to give you a little something extra to strive for. Honestly, any of the frustrations I've listed are not insurmountable and can be quite fun in the right mindset. Not only did this game have to deal with trying new things in a well-defined genre, I'd also hazard a guess and say that a good majority of you did not start with this game. No, I'm not even talking about the kids who jumped on with Sonic Adventure 2 or Heroes. I'm still talking to old farts like myself. There's a good chance that this wasn't your first Sonic game. The first Sonic game was my first experience with the Hedgehog, but it wasn't my first Sonic game. I only ever really remember playing Green Hill Zone and a bit of Marble before I had my own copy. I imagine that's probably the same case for a lot of kids at the time. There were plenty who hopped onto the Genesis with Sonic 1, sure, but for those of us who had not been so lucky yet, really, how much Sonic 1 were you really going to be exposed to? It's not like Sega gave us a lot of breathing room between this and Sonic 2, which came out only a year after the first game. Sonic 2 was the best-selling game on the system, and quickly came packed in with the machine, and then had both games packed in, meaning a lot of younger gamers had a lot of direct comparisons to make between Sonic 1 and 2 from the very first day with their Sega Genesis. My point is, hindsight and time works against this game, and while it doesn't excuse any fault it does deserve a mention. So with all of that said, we shut a loop back to the original question. Was Sonic ever good to begin with? Well, not only was he good, not only was he great, he was important. Mario wrote the rulebook for a platform. Sonic came in, kind of skimmed through the pages, got the basic gist of it, and then said it's okay to break some of the rules. You can still have a fun time. I appreciate Nintendo. I really do. But their old school way of doing things is a bit of a double-edged sword, which is still swinging around and leaving a few cuts to this day. Nintendo was what the game market needed in the late 80s. They needed some discipline and standards to survive the mess they got themselves into. But once things got back on track, Nintendo didn't loosen its grip on the leash. Sooner or later, that pendulum had a swing back, and it came back in the form of a spiny blue ball. Sonic shook things up, not only for consumers, but also developers. It let them know that they had viable options out there. The game industry was back on its feet, and a little competition was only going to benefit everybody. Regardless of how you feel about the console marketplace nowadays, Sega helped establish what the market is today, and it certainly makes things more exciting for our weird little world. Sony fanboy or x it's nice to have options. And whether you grew up on a Genesis, a PlayStation, or a Nintendo, hell, even an iPhone, I feel the gaming industry lost something important the day Sega stepped out of the hardware ring. They may still be around, but nobody takes them seriously these days, and that's kind of why I don't want to see Sonic go the same way as so many other game series. And if you care about gaming, you shouldn't either. I like shooters and open world games just fine, and while I don't play them myself, I have no issues with sports games. I feel like games can be a big enough space that everyone can find something they like, but I also like that I have the option to play a colorful platformer that doesn't come from Nintendo without having to wait for some indie project to come out of Kickstarter or wade through the garbage on Steam Greenlight. I do want to see games be taken more seriously. I want to see them grow in 
expand, but it shouldn't have to come at the cost of a series that helped us get to where we are today. Look, I'm not about to excuse the truly bad games in this series. I'm not going to tell you to ignore the bad choices Sega made or that they didn't deserve to be where they are. I'm not saying reward Sega with your money when they give you unfinished garbage. But on the flip side, that doesn't mean we should want Sonic to go away forever either. I just want them to do better. When you love something or someone, you don't turn a blind eye when it's screwing up. You smack it in the mouth and you say, hey, get your shit together. Sonic was an integral part of the game industry and has constantly tried to reinvent what it means to be a Sonic game ever since then. When really, he doesn't have to. He did his part. He established his brand. Just improve on that and settle into your niche, at least for a while. We deserve more platformers with Sonic 3 quality, and the 3D games had so much more potential with the adventure mechanics. I mean, the game wasn't perfect, but Sonic played great. Why not explore what works instead of forcing your fans to relearn how to play your games with every new title? Still, despite the flaws in later games, despite the inconsistency of quality, there's still a weird charm to all these off-the-wall ideas Sega gives this franchise. Sure, it'd be nice if they turned out better games or stick to a formula until they got it right, but at least they keep things interesting. And honestly, I feel like they're finally learning. Sonic Media looks incredible. And whatever that 2017 game is, it looks like they're bringing back gameplay elements that work for Sonic Generations. A title that naysayers seem to always ignore when they talk about how bad Sonic is these days. And even among all this negativity, when you have so much of gaming media jeering at this series, you have the Sonic social media team directly responding to them, speaking for its fans with a reasonable, optimistic voice, posting ridiculous jokes on Twitter and Facebook, laughing at themselves and their more notorious titles, setting up celebrations for fans of all ages and enlisting actual fans who have a solid understanding of Sonic games to make actual Sonic games. Meanwhile, Nintendo pulls down non-profit fan-made games and gives you Federation Force instead. Look, Sega is still a large company, and if it ever got Nintendo big, who's to say they wouldn't be pulling off more anti-consumer shenanigans? Who knows? For now, it feels like they finally understand what Sonic meant to gaming history, and what he means to his fans today, and that's something to be celebrated. We're going to look at this stuff in future episodes. We still have to talk about the truly notorious Sonic titles, the fan base, cartoons, comics, all this stuff. But for now, I hope you have a better understanding of why a grown man will put so much time and energy into a video about a speedy little blue hedgehog. Ugh, well, I think that's a good stopping point for today. We will, of course, look further into the series. I'm going to break it up into other games so we're not just talking about Sonic all the time, but expect to see quite a lot of them here. That is, of course, if you do me the honor of being a returning guest to the series. I know asking for likes and subscriptions or bell ringings or whatever the hell YouTube's doing can be a bit grating if you watch a lot of shows like this, and I'll do my best to keep that at a minimum. But since I am striking out into the overpopulated world that is YouTube gaming channels, taking a couple seconds to hit a like button would help a lot. If you've enjoyed what you saw, consider subscribing subscribing to come along with me on this weird little journey. I'm hoping this will be the first of many episodes and to evolve the quality the further we go. This video is actually my first real attempt at editing any kind of videos online. I taught myself what I could do just to get this out the door, and hopefully those skills will improve in time. And of course, I'd love to know what you thought, good or bad, about the show itself, about Sonic, or maybe even a game you feel gets a bit too much hate. Throw your suggestions my way, and let's have a talk about it. Until then, this Sonic fan thanks you for taking time out of your day to watch this silly little video. I'll be back soon to talk about some other games, and when we get back to Sonic, we'll of course be following up with Sonic 2, and then probably all the other Sonic games, which are... How many of those are there? there oh my god, what have I done? Hello there, I'm Nick, and this is The Game Apologist, where we look for the good in bad games. This is our second episode, so I thought it was only fitting we do a sequel. Now, a unique thing about video games is, usually you don't get the best game of a series within its first century, and that's because games usually focus on the mechanics, or how the player interacts with the medium, that unique quality video games have over movies and books. But what about a game that focuses on a narrative? What if you got a game that's so good, a game that's so complete, a game where the developers gave it their all the first time around, well, you get something truly special, and Bioshock, to many, was one of those games. Now, just in case you don't know what this game's all about, let me lay out the first game in an offensively quick summary. Bioshock is a first-person shooter with horror elements. You take on the role of Jack as he comes across the underwater city of Rapture after the world's worst New Year's Eve party. This amazing wonder created by one Andrew Ryan as a place for the world's greatest minds to unleash their full potential without the petty restrictions of the surface world. As you can see, did not work out too well. You had to fight through all this wrecked art deco goodness against the Splicers, the denizens of Rapture who took too much of the resident wonder drug, Adam, that give him superpowers and makes them look like microwave Barbie dolls. And you'll also have to contest against the big daddies, these lumbering monster men who act as guard dogs for these creepy zombie toddlers known as little sisters, who roam around Rapture stabbing dead bodies and absorbing the Adam within. You fight with a variety of weapons and powers by means of plasmids, which let you shoot fire, ice, and oh, no, not the beast! Not the beast! Ah! Oh, no!
Sorry, that joke had happened. I'm sorry. Let's just move on. My skin's itching just watching this footage. As you explore, you'll find audio diaries. Talk with a man named Atlas over a radio. Uncover what happened to the city. And that's all I'm really comfortable telling you. Because unlike a lot of other games of this type and of the time, Bioshock focused on its insane narrative. Everything and everyone has its place and purpose. And as crazy as the story gets, it does come to a definitive close. About one of two closes anyway. There might be a couple of loose ends I'm not thinking of, but nothing that really comes to mind. And not without real heavy analysis. Which actually is part of the appeal of Bioshock. We could talk about the obvious references to Ayn Rand and her works. How the game takes her objectivist philosophy to task by showing the potential outcome of such a society. We could talk about meta narrative of video game storytelling, what it means to be an individual, or the subtle storytelling in the audio logs and the environment, that big crazy twist. All of this is what makes the story of Bioshock so compelling. And regardless of where you come down on the narrative, it does give you a lot to talk about. Even if you don't like it, or you disagree with the message, it's still doing its job because you're going to have a lot to debate, as can be seen in the countless videos, forums, and fan theories dedicated to the tale woven by Ken Levine and the team that was once known as 2K Boston. That's some pretty deep stuff because it's at the bottom of the ocean. That's a joke. I'm good at those and you're welcome. And that's to say nothing of Rapture itself, which is one of the greatest game environments ever conceived. Dangerous and war-torn, but still so beautiful that you're compelled to walk down the next low-lit, blood-splattered hallway just to see what's next. You gotta give him credit for going to all this effort for just one game, where so many others would leave cliffhangers for future titles. Bioshock creates an incredible world and does everything it intended to do with a single game. This has led it to be considered one of the greatest games of its generation, and will probably be remembered as one of the greatest of all time. And in the AAA gaming world, you never leave well enough alone. It was inevitable that a sequel would happen, but something this unique would take a lot of time. So Ken Levine and the now renamed Irrational Games would get to work, and six years later would release Bioshock Infinite, which while great on its own, has a lot of parallels to the first game. Replace the underwater city of Rapture with the city in the sky of Columbia, replace Splicers with uh, religious zealots, replace Big Daddies with Songbird and Handyman and George Washington, replace Little Sisters with Elizabeth, replace Andrew Ryan with Comstock, replace Adam and Plasmids with Salts and Vigors, replace that convoluted complex story with... <laughs> oh my god. Now each game has their own unique qualities, and you can argue how well some of these parallels work, but all the same, they are there, and they're very intentional. There are slight spoilers ahead, but I don't want to get too much more into the story itself because A, in case you've never played either game, I don't want to ruin anything for you, and B, in either case or both, there's a lot to unpack, and we be here all day. So that's Bioshock and Bioshock Infinite. Got it? Great. Thanks for watching, and oh, oh, what's this? Bioshock 2? Well, how'd that sneak in there? Yep, between the two games came a sequel, but for some reason, it's often left out of the conversation when it comes to this franchise. But why? Well, before the game ever came out, there was a lot working against it. What little gamers knew left them very concerned. First off, the title. Bioshock 2. That number. That silly little number. 2. Like I said, Bioshock did everything it intended to do and had a very definitive ending. Uh, well, one of two endings. A two normally implies a continuation, and with a game that had such a heavy focus on the narrative, how the hell were they planning on continuing after that conclusion? And which one would it be? Which one was canon? Imagine making a Citizen Kane 2 or a Titanic 2, and you have a pretty good idea of how some people felt after seeing that number slapped on the end there. And surely we weren't going to be playing Jack again, were we? Well, no. We had a brand new protagonist, and with him, another warning sign. We were now playing as a big daddy. Yes, one of those mindless walking death machines. So if there already wasn't enough concern about the story, how the hell were we supposed to have an engaging narrative following this lumbering brute? And narrative aside, what about the tone? In the first game, we arrived in Rapture a defenseless human being in a dark, claustrophobic world full of murderous psychopaths, giving you a sense of tension and dread. And we are now basically playing the apex predator of this little aquarium world. And the gameplay, how does that work? You'll either have a big daddy who's so overpowered that nothing really poses a threat, or you have one that's so weak that you can still be scared and at that point why even be a big daddy and then to top it all off they added a multiplayer component to bioshock why well at least we have ken levine in irrational game so everything should turn out f nope different development team great everything pointed to 2k just pushing this out for a quick buck diluting the quality of the brand and making just another basic ass first person shooter call it duty for dummies so with all these potential problems how'd it turn out not bad. Great, actually, if you go by the reviews at the time. We got a perfectly competent game. Played just fine. Story was simple but inoffensive. The multiplayer was... Eh, wasn't bad. 
it was just there. And reviews basically said the same thing, with the game getting 8s and 9s out of 10s all over the place. And really, when people talk about problems in the series, don't be surprised if you actually hear more gripes about the third game, Bioshock Infinite. To understand what that means, we have to understand the problems of the first game. Yes, I know this is getting into the weeds a little bit here, but what were you expecting from a Bioshock episode? Look, regardless of how deep the narrative can get in Infinite or the original, they are still video game ass video games. You're still shooting the ever living hell out of everything around you. You still have collectibles, power ups, bonkers superpowers, and the works. Bioshock had all this crazy crap and it still plays perfectly fine, but it certainly could have used some fine tuning. Shooting doesn't feel super great, you replenish health manually by pressing a face button, and you can hack machines by entering a puzzle minigame that completely breaks the flow of the main game, and this nonsense is everywhere. And as good as the story can be, they have this stupid black and white moral code nonsense in the form of whether or not you decide to kill little girls. Guess which choice gives you the bad ending? And if you decide to turn them back to normal, they somehow become even more grotesque. And then they end the game with this stupid boss fight with a giant metal man that you have to take down with the help of toddlers. I won't get into the ending here, but it's not great. Either one. It's like they built their story up to that big crazy twist you probably already know about, but didn't really know where to go from there. And making Jack a mute did not help matters, regardless of how they try to justify it. Bioshock Infinite would tackle some of these issues, namely by making the protagonists, Booker and Elizabeth, the most compelling characters at any given time. They took those weak endings and instead made one that's completely bonkers, and the gameplay would be streamlined for more modern standards. But on that particular point, I feel they threw the baby out with the, well, ocean. There are nods to the original's gameplay, certainly. It's still very Bioshock in many ways. But the modern mechanics and the slew of new ideas sometimes feel unrefined and unfinished. You now get the standard recharging shield, which means you'll be dugging around plenty of corners and just waiting for it to fill back up. You don't have a mess of an inventory anymore. The upgrades are ridiculously simplified, but I don't know. It just feels a bit too stripped down. And the vigors are cool as hell, but I don't know if they're really utilized to their full potential. And outside of a couple enemy types you rarely see, somehow you're the only one in this entire city using this stuff. But again, that could be said for all three games. And Elizabeth's terribility is... Uh, well, I mean, it's fine, but it's just there for the most part. Feels like they could have done a lot more with this, outside of just spawning stuff that should have already been there to begin with. And this emphasis on the skyhooks. I think it's pretty obvious that this was originally meant to be a means of traversal between areas, potentially for an open world setting or something like that. But they feel fairly pointless here. I mean, it looks cool in spots, sure, gives a roller coaster vibe to it, but in combat, it's just silly. And apparently everyone has one of these, which makes no sense. I mean, here's the gate between you and the holding cell of the single most important person in this society. But as long as you have a skyhook, up and over. Thank you very much, I'll see myself in. And then the DLC extra story, what the hell are they doing in Rapture? It looks ridiculous. And then the enemies themselves. Boys of Silence are these creepy dudes who stand still, shining a light you have to avoid. Okay, so I think it's fairly obvious, going by the design and the fact that they're called Boys of Goddamn Silence, that the game originally had them detect you by means of sound. And at some point, they just scrapped the idea and slapped some flashlights on their faces and called it a day. And that tedious ghost fight? <sighs> God, I'm frustrated just thinking about it. And Songbird, good lord. Talk about a waste. So this is Infinite's version of the Big Daddy. Now, if you don't know why Big Daddies were so cool, let me tell you why they were so cool. In the first game, they built up the threat of these dudes like nobody's business. They tease you by putting him on the other side of a wall. Then he wrecks a splicer, smashes him through the barrier between the two of you, as if to say nothing will keep you safe from this bad boy. So when you're finally in the same room as one of these guys, you feel like you're in for the fight of your life. But then you get there and he just, well, bye, I guess. The big daddy only cares about the protection of the little sister, so unless you're stupid enough to pick a fight, it's gonna carry on doing just that. It's such a cool mechanic. It makes Rapture feel that much more real by watching one of gaming's weirdest relationships play out its day-to-day -day life. Not everything has to automatically want to kill you because this is a video game world and everything needs to be an obstacle. It just walks right by without a care. That's how little of a threat you are to this thing. Now, if you do touch the little girl, he will touch you back with a giant drill. If you want to avoid becoming a man smoothie, you can carry on without ever bothering them. But considering the massive rewards that can help you through this adventure, you may just have to pick that fight. And god damn, is it as terrifying as tough as you'd expect. This is one of the coolest, weirdest, most interesting things about the original game. So you get to Songbird, who they play up the threat of, again, and again, and do I ever actually fight this thing? Well, no. No, you don't. 
Outside of the cutscenes, you never actually fight this big bird in a gimp suit, no matter how naughty you've been. And maybe they were scared away after that stupid last boss fight from the original game, but you consider the original Big Daddy Battles boss fights, couldn't you? And those are some of the best moments. I mean, they could have given us a chase sequence or anything that we can interact with. I mean, they made a statue out of this thing for the collector's edition. What an absolute waste. And yes, they do have the motorized patriots and the handymen, but they're just not the same. So when you consider all these gripes, why do the episode on Bioshock 2? It's scored well, it's sold well. The way I'm whining, it sounds like Infinite is the odd one out here. But it's still part of the conversation because, well, I mean, look at it. Infinite, like the original game, does so much, so well, that despite whatever complaints people may have with the game, it doesn't take away from an unbelievable experience. Whatever it gets wrong, it makes up for in spades with the positives. With the release of Infinite, we got another grand spectacle on the scale only the likes of Levine could create, and they did it by introducing us to a brand new environment, new characters, and a new story with all sorts of complex philosophies, social issues, and meta narratives to pick apart. And not to ruin too much, there are a lot of parallels to the original Bioshock. It does, in some weird ways, continue that story. And that's to say nothing of the constant references and easter eggs. But even with this insane amount of content, is there a single reference to Bioshock 2? Nope. Nary a tip of the hat. Nothing. Nada. Irrational acted as if that game never happened. And in turn, I feel a lot of the fanbase felt the same way. We were quickly reminded that Bioshock 2's narrative was never this complex or nuanced. It didn't set the gaming world on fire. It didn't have every podcast and YouTube show debating for hours on end about what it all meant. It didn't inspire insane fan theories that will blow your mind. Irrational made Bioshock 2 irrelevant and it kind of feels intentional now you could make parallels between elizabeth and eleanor both games use lamb quite heavily but i feel in both cases they were just obvious extensions of some of the most interesting aspects of the original game namely tackling an extreme ideology and the relationship between the little sister and the big daddy one at least attempting to be figurative and letting players sort that out for themselves and the other being quite literal about it in infinite any reference to the original game as subtle or as on the nose as it gets seems to be a loving one but anything you could compare with in Bioshock 2, it's either quite a stretch or infinite saying, we can do this way better. So here we are, once again, blathering on forever without getting to the meat of things. Didn't originally intend for this to be so long, but there's a lot to pick apart and I love to ramble. And honestly, I really don't want to do an episode covering Bioshock Infinite. But now that it's here, I feel it's worth mentioning when talking about Bioshock 2. Because even as I was watching older views of Bioshock 2, I was still shaking my head at some of the praise people were giving this game. Some talked about the multiplayer, the competent gameplay, some even said the story had improved thanks to its simplicity, and I think that's where Bioshock fans roll their eyes at the sequel. Without Levine, Bioshock 2 just doesn't seem to get it. The tone is gone. Even when they try to scare or creep you out, it just feels silly when I have a goddamn drill for a hand. The new antagonist, Sophia Lamb, is nowhere near as compelling as Andrew Ryan. The story is simple and streamlined, but Bioshock fans don't like simple and streamlined. The goal of the enemy is just stupid, and when they do try to slip in characters from the first game, it feels not right. Trying to play up the importance of these new players, reconning the history of Rapture, it just feels like bad fan fiction. If these characters were here from the beginning, why am I only now just hearing about them? Even when you get the audio logs of Andrew Ryan talking about Lamb, he sounds annoyed that he even has to bother with her nonsense. Ryan, I'm here. My cult will end your tyranny. Did I mention I'm here? I chose Rapture. Ah, oh, God, what do you want? Sense of self is a plague. Yes, that's my soapbox. I'm saying free will is bad. Isn't that such a complicated subject that really adds dimension to my character? Don't I make my philosophy sound compelling, even when it's clearly wrong? No. No, no you really don't. That's actually kind of stupid. Ryan, I'm here. Free will. Sense of self. Butterflies. I'm not really sure what they're alluding to. But butterflies. You don't matter. Stop pretending Butterfly. you matter. And this game tries to explain it all away by throwing her into jail during the events of the first game. So yeah, these are the problems I noticed, and others seem to as well. I'm a huge fan of the series. Hell, the original Bioshock is the reason I got an Xbox 360 and an HDTV. But I didn't choose the game for the story. I chose Rapture. I'm sorry, I had to. I mean, the story did sound great prior to release, but that's not what caught my eye. We've had great narratives and games prior to this release, but the stage on which it was set was just unlike anything else. The art direction, the concept, I wanted to explore this world so badly. So badly that I made the expensive leap to the next generation of consoles. I've never before bought a TV just to play a video game. Because Rapture quickly became one of the greatest environments in gaming history. And despite the splicers, I never wanted to leave. And that's why I love Bioshock 2 so much. Yes, just taken at face value, it's largely more of the same. Just tweaks the gameplay and lets you loose on a different part of the city. And that's all I wanted. So when I hear people tell others just to skip 2 and go straight to 
to infinite? I know they're saying that for the sake of the lore, but all I hear is just completely skip some amazing portions of this incredible city. They're saying skip Ryan Amusements, skip Sirens Alley, skip a chance to walk around outside, in the water. Actually, uh, I'm a little uncomfortable here. Let's just go back inside. Rapture is just so good. You can say some of these maps aren't as meticulous or as beautiful as the original game, but so what? Look at this place. It's amazing. I want to be in this world forever. I don't need overly complicated meta narratives every time I visit. I don't care if it doesn't constantly reference a book I've never read, and most of you didn't either. Shut up. I know a massive complaint with this game's story is how irrelevant it ultimately ends up being. It takes place 10 years after events of the first game. It features characters who never really matter to the lore, who promptly remove themselves by the end of the game, but that's fine. This is a city. Tell me some other stories. Like, oh, hey, a big daddy. Let's jump directly into the shoes of one of the most intriguing creations from this gaming world. His character is simple, and in turn, his story is simple. He's a big daddy. He has to get his little sister, Eleanor. He goes on a quest to get Eleanor. Great, wonderful, that's all I need. They of course expand on the lore through audio logs, give you a small supporting cast with well-defined personalities, and add a hint of mystery with the fact that you've been dead for a decade, but for some reason you're back. I don't mind having a smaller, more personal tale that doesn't tie into the fate of everything ever. I care about Eleanor, and I hate Sophia Lamb's smug, stupid face. It's not a perfect tale, but it's engaging all the same. And at the very least, they have a decent excuse for a silent protagonist this time around. Honestly, as crazy as things get with Jack or Booker, Subject Delta is hands down my favorite playable character from this trilogy. Because it's just so damn cool. Yes, I know it's a pandering, stupid choice to make you a big daddy, but all things considered, they handle Delta pretty well. Instead of the lumbering bouncer or rosy versions of the big daddy, they instead use a new type called the Alpha series, a leaner prototype version of these scuba steves on steroids. And you also get to play around with this. Hell yes. And he just looks cool. I know you can't see him most of the time, but I still love this design. It's certainly better than Jack, king of the ugly Christmas sweater. I mean, just look at that stupid thing. Looks like he grabbed it out of his grandmother's Goodwill donation. I didn't notice that until a snapshot near the end of the game, and I was just disgusted. That's what I've been wearing this whole time? In this world full of walking Picasso paintings, barely being held together by their soggy stained rags? I'm somehow the most hideous thing down here. I mean, they have little girls that look like they're made out of blue cheese, and I'm still way more terrifying. Could at least give me one of those cool bunny masks to hide my shame. I just, oh God, I hate that stupid sweater so much. I adore playing Delta. I thought the idea of playing a big daddy was rad as hell. I do, in fact, think it's really cool to play the most badass enemy from the first game, or at least a version of it. And even though they do add plasmids and guns, they at least give you an arsenal that makes sense for Delta. There's no pistols or wrenches. No, no. Outside of that wonderful drill, the smallest projectile weapon you get is a rivet gun, as well as a shotgun, a giant machine gun, a spear gun, a rocket launcher. Everything has weight to it. Everything feels like it packs a nasty punch, and all within the hands of somebody who can handle it with ease. And the jerks you shoot all this stuff at have also upped their games. Splicers have further mutated in the 10 years that have passed, looking more twisted than ever before and becoming way more adept at killing big daddies. Some even come in extra large brutish forms to better tackle you with. The original two types of big daddies are back, as well as a new rumbler, and eventually you get a battle with other alpha series. And of course, the new star attraction, the big sister. A grown-up little sister big daddy-fied with crazy psychic powers that hops around all of creation with insane speed and agility, giving you a completely different kind of fight and putting Delta's sturdiness to a real test. No, you're no longer going to have that same terror in your heart like you did the first time you saw a bouncer in the first game. But that's okay. You're in a different role, and these encounters, in turn, are tackled in a slightly different way. Less David and Goliath and more of a kaiju fight. And honestly, that's what Jack practically was by the end of the first game. The first encounters were scary, yeah. Yeah, but you were so jacked up on gene enhancements, health upgrades, and plasmid varieties that didn't really matter by the end. Hell, a portion near the end of the game was turning Jack into a big daddy. I could not have been the only one stoked when I got to this portion of the game. It felt like the game was saying, Look, we beefed you up to a point where nothing we really do is going to scare you anyway. We might as well reward you by turning you into the top dog of this fishbowl. And then it turned out to be the most tedious portion of the whole experience. In two, they made it a ton of fun. And yes, the shift does take its toll on the tone, but I'm personally alright with that too. I know a lot of reviews whined about how Rapture doesn't have that same sense of wonder and discovery the second time around. And I don't really think there was a way to do that, but I think the developers knew it. You're playing a big daddy. You're playing one of the most essential parts of Rapture structure while it was still up and running. You're not discovering anything. You're coming home. They do try to give you some sense of wonder in the portions that let you walk around outside, and no, it doesn't surpass that reveal of Rapture the first time around, but it's still cool all the same. I like that you're more than a big daddy in name alone. You get to do things like this. 
And speaking of being a big daddy, this also completely changes the relationship you have with the little sisters. Even with those creepy glowing eyes and blue cheese skin, they're nowhere near as creepy as they were in the original game, nor should they be. Considering what you are to this world, what you are to them, that dynamic has to shift. So when you take down another big daddy, instead of the little sister screaming and trying to keep away from you, she looks up and smiles at you. Instead of being a terrifying demon baby, it's now this small defenseless child who trusts you implicitly. Now granted, they do bring back the stupid black and white moral choice nonsense, mostly in the form of choosing between saving or harvesting the sisters, but at least in this game, I feel these choices have a bit more weight to it. I couldn't even bring myself to kill one of these little snots just to film an example for this video, especially after protecting from the psychotic splicers while she was trying to fetch Adam for me, which turns out to be one of the best parts of this game. You can have the sisters do what they do best and reap the reward. Rewards. But once you set that child onto a dead body, and I can't believe I play a video game that lets you do that, Rapture's worst will come out of the woodwork while she's stabbing said dead person. Before you set her down, you can prep the area with traps, predict choke points, and find other ways to strategize against the oncoming horde. And it's an absolute blast. And it's here I think that Bioshock 2 might actually be superior to its older and younger siblings. The shift in tone, character, and story all works because of that gameplay I keep mentioning. Like I keep saying, it's fun to be Delta. Are there spots in the gameplay that work better in the first game in Infinite? Yeah, sure. Jack can be somewhat more stealthy if desired, which can be a hoot in itself, and Booker does feel more fluid, and there are times I appreciate not having to navigate through a ridiculous amount of guns. But 2 does its best to improve and tweak the mechanics given to us from the first game, all while making sense for a monster man who makes whale noises. It succeeds where the other games fall short and falls a bit short where the other two succeed. And that's what matters most in a video game, right? The gameplay. So clearly Bioshock 2 is the superior game of the three, right? Uh, no, not really. If you put a drill to my head and made me choose, I would still choose the original Bioshock. But for all the reasons I just rambled, I don't think you should skip out on the second game if you love Rapture as much as I do. That's really all I'm trying to say here. If you have one of those friends who knows everything there is to know about video games and this series and they tell you to pass on this, maybe don't pass on this. And if you are one of those pretentious little punks who dismissed this game outright because your lord and savior Ken Levine didn't lend his golden touch to the development, stop pretending you're better than this. I'm sure you've read Atlas Shrugged a hundred times and it's sitting right next to your special edition Big Daddy figurine and your Songbird plush. But these games are still games, full of stupid superpowers, gratuitous violence, and bang bang shoot the hell out of everything that moves gameplay. Bioshock 2 just isn't ashamed to admit it. But even with the improvements, none of these games are perfect mechanically. They're still disorganized, not sure what the hell they want to be at times, overdesigned in spots, underdesigned in others, this or that, but who cares? There just isn't anything else like this series in the gaming world. I mean... Except, well, okay, but, okay, it inspired a lot for the gaming world. And even though I say the original is still the best, while I'm playing the sequels, I have a hard time not putting 2 or Infinite on the first place podium. They're still amazing for their own reasons. And I didn't even mention Minerva's Den, the DLC extra story for Bioshock 2. I didn't mention it because... Well, it seems to be the one area of the game that people recommend you play. But why this over the main game itself? It still stars a big daddy, still generally plays like Bioshock 2, it still has a very personal story. I think it's probably because this is a nice, tight experience. While I do feel the story of Delta and Eleanor are fine, it probably didn't need to be a 15 hour experience. Again, I love the gameplay in the world, so no problems on my end, but Minerva's Den strips it down to just the bare essentials. And it's with this I feel you could find some future potential for this series. Bioshock 2, and more specifically Minerva's Den, shows the storytelling potential of Rapture. And now Columbia. We don't need to constantly revisit Andrew Ryan, Comstock, or any of these other big players to the Meteor games. There's still a lot of potential for smaller stories. I mean, the Minerva's Den team went on to make Gone Home. What could you do with Rapture if you gave it to the team behind Soma or Amnesia? Or man, could you imagine a virtual reality experience in Rapture? The city of Rapture was meant for the greatest minds to come together to unleash some amazing potential. Let smaller creative developers go nuts in this world while 2K hands off the bigger experiences to larger teams. Can't be the only one who'd love to see what the likes of Arcane could do with this brand. I think it's also worth pointing out that while Bioshock 1 went with the perspectives of people at the top of the food chain, Ryan, Atlas, Scientist, etc. Bioshock 2 gave you insight to the lesser characters. You saw what one man went through to try and be with his daughter. You saw the perspective of the little sisters even. And that was something we really didn't have the time or interest in thinking about when we were dealing with all the grandiose plotlines of one. Bioshock 2 wasn't about grand New Year's Eve parties for the elite. It was about the working class. It was about the people who came
came to rapture with their dreams and found themselves being subjected to the same helplessness of their former lives, but under the guise of Atlas Shrugged objectivism. I firmly believe that there was more character development packed into Bioshock 2 than either of the other games, and while that doesn't necessarily solidify it as the best of the three, it certainly does mean that it will appeal to a crowd that cares about that sort of thing. Bioshock 2 showed us even more of that dark, seedy underside of Rapture, the stomach-turning things done to the people who weren't elite and weren't smart enough to make it of their own merit, and it showed you the desperation that its denizens were left in in the wake of that. Oh my god, dinosaurs are awesome! That's the basic premise behind the smash hit franchise Jurassic Park. Probably. Start off as a novel by Michael Crichton, and then adapted into a movie by Steven Spielberg, Jurassic Park told the story of an island-based theme park full of dinosaurs, a group of scientists, some kids, and a lawyer who go to check it out before opening day. All the dinosaurs break loose, and there's implications of trying to play God, and blah blah blah. You all know this stuff. It's Jurassic Park, man. I can't be the first person to tell you this movie exists. And if I am, well, go watch it. Duh. But of course, you've already seen it. Everybody knows this property. Even 20 plus years after its initial release, this name still means something. Jurassic World released in 2015 and was the highest grossing movie of that year, only to be dethroned by the revived Star Wars franchise that winter. And it's still like, I think like the fourth highest grossing movie of all time? That's bananas. Whoever thought a T-Rex could go toe to toe with Darth Vader in terms of popularity? Well, me for starters, because Jurassic Park was my Star Wars. As a young kid in 1993, there was simply nothing else like this movie. My jaw dropped the first time a dinosaur walked onto the screen. It looked so real. My heart broke at the sight of the sick Triceratops, and then it stopped with the appearance of the T-Rex. And then the raptors, well, well, they just became the coolest damn thing that ever existed, even though they are voiced by tortoisex. I'm, I'm serious, that's one of the noises they make. Over the years, there has been a wealth of behind the scenes content detailing how the effects team created the revolutionary look of the dinosaurs using a combination of CGI and practical effects. Here's some info we didn't know though. The dinosaur sound effects were created with animal sex sounds. For example, velociraptors emit sounds of turtle love. Jurassic Park sound designer Gary Ridstrom says, quote, it's somewhat embarrassing, but when the raptors bark at each other to communicate, it's a tortoise having sex. Let's start with the NES game, which puts you in the shoes of Alan Grant and has you exploring the island from a bird's eye perspective. The game is broken into levels where you're collecting eggs, key cards, river rafting, and saving stupid kids from being eaten by- WHY WOULD YOU BE IN THE T-REX ENCLOSURE? WHO LOOKED AT THAT SIGN AND SAYS, OH PERFECT, THEY'LL NEVER FIND ME HERE. Oh, oh, oh that's, that's probably, that's probably why. Is that how the T-Rex hunts? Oh my god, no wonder it went extinct. For a late NES game, the lack of a map or save feature is a bit of a pain in the ass, and they aren't kidding around with those question mark boxes. You honestly have no idea what's gonna be in there. They'll either give you health, or kill you. Thanks game, glad I have to gamble every single time I need health. It can be hard, downright unfair, as these older games tend to be. And truthfully, I never beat this game as a kid. But I remember always having a good time when I played it. Even today, while I'm not the biggest fan of overhead action games, this still plays nicely. The map layout isn't perfect, but I have a lot of fun exploring and blasting raptors all the same. You're probably going to be smacked around a bit if this is your first time playing, but once you get the general idea of where things are, really, you're going to have an hour or two with this game at the most. That's just how it is with most older games. Once you have the lay of the land, you really won't be sinking that much time into it. And I've heard that this game actually takes more from the Jurassic Park book, as you explore stuff never shown in the movie. I haven't read the book since I was a kid, so I can't really say for myself, but if that is the case, that's cool as hell. And it certainly makes me more inclined to go back and read the book. Or just use audible.com. That's right, just sign on to audible and use the offer code I don't have any sponsorship because I'm a nobody. The Game Boy game is basically the same but portable. Man, actually I thought this was really cool as a kid. I'm sure this happened way more often than I was aware, but I rarely got a carbon copy of one of my console games in portable form. So it was really cool seeing this game on the go. Now there are some slight changes between this and the console counterpart, but nothing of real note here. Well, outside of the massive change to the T-Rex encounter. Which, as far as I can tell, is the only game to use that vision is based off movement bullcrap. It's a little uh, frustrating, but I, I thought it was kind of cool. 
The Super Nintendo game, at first glance, seems like a prettier version of the NES and Game Boy games. There are plenty of similarities, the overhead playstyle, egg collecting, even a lot of the same weapons, but this is more of a poor man's link to the past meets a diet doom. Interesting playstyle combination, but not as refined as either game it takes inspiration from. You get all of the island right from the start, but, well, kind of. You have to unlock gated off portions, but it's essentially one map. This unfortunately makes the lack of navigation tools or a save function even more offensive here, but if you're playing this game in the modern age, well, there are very easy solutions to those problems. So let's not keep griping about that. Having all of Isla Nublar to explore was really cool and very intimidating. Because unlike the NES version, where the likes of the Tyrannosaur are relegated to a boss fight, in this game, you could just be strolling along your merry way and oh my god, oh my god, oh my god, oh my god. You also get these neato first person segments every time you go into a building. Very primitive by today's standards, but very cool back in 93. There was always something so creepy about these portions. Granted, they became a lot less creepy once you had a rocket launcher. Now, I would recommend taking a guide along with this game, but if you're up for a bit of exploring, it's a lot of fun. Just keep in mind, this game isn't great at telling you where to go or what to do to win. Hell, I've never beaten it myself, but I had a lot of fun picking this game back up for this video, and I fully intend to finally complete my adventure on the Super Nintendo. The SNES version, in my opinion, is easily the best of the three Nintendo games, but I have to tell you, all three were a blast to play again. And if you're a fan of game music, give these titles a listen. Wonderfully catchy. Because that's why we love Jurassic Park. That dope-ass dino beat. And strangely enough, this game actually got a sequel. Jurassic Park 2, The Chaos Continues. This was a little confusing back in the day since there was a long wait between Jurassic Park and its sequel, Lost World. I was really confused as a kid. Was this based off a sequel I hadn't heard about? Was this the title? What's going on here? Well, it didn't turn out to be anything like that. It was just another excuse to keep the franchise relevant between the movies. And it came in the form of a hard as hell side-scrolling shooter. Absolutely nothing like the first game, but it still plays pretty well. I actually like this animated look, especially the impressive opening cutscene. Looks like an adaptation for a Saturday morning cartoon version of Jurassic Park, which, let's be real, had to be in talks at some point. Anyway, nice to see some visual variance between these games. It's not perfect. You'll be spending a lot of time just shooting and slowly creeping ahead because you know that an enemy's just right off screen and this game gives you very little time to react, which can be a problem because if you blast too many dinos that aren't the Rex or Raptors, you may very well cause a second extinction for these animals. That counter up there indicates how many dinosaurs are left on the island. Blast too many and the park can't open again. Or I guess ever because it didn't the first time and this doesn't really seem like a good idea. Why are we here again? But I have to admit, I found this extra layer of challenge somewhat clever. A couple of the other games gave you some non-lethal options for the dinosaurs, but absolutely no reason to use it. Why would you give a raptor a little nap? just so we can get back up all refreshed and ready to kill you all over again. Way easier to just send it back to the Stone Age. In this game, you have to conserve these creatures best you can and not let that counter get too low. But even that isn't a problem if you're patient, as the number will start to rise after a while. Life, uh, finds a way. Ah. Also, this is a completely needless gripe, but I don't know where else I'm gonna say anything about it. This generic action figure you're playing is apparently Alan Grant. The, uh, okay, whatever. Not too surprising. Did you see what they packed with the actual action figures? Jurassic Park, the dinosaurs are on the loose again. Now Grant's armed to the teeth and Malcolm's loaded with weapons. And while we're on pointless nitpicks, I hate fighting other humans. Don't get me wrong, it plays as you'd expect, but I'm here for the dinosaurs, man. Let me blow up a T-Rex. Oh my god, they actually let you do that. To be completely honest with you, this game is incredibly frustrating, especially if you're jumping in for the first time. But again, I have to commend the ambition here. The art style is nice, the animation is smooth, the controls are responsive, you could do a lot worse. And Chaos Continues also continues on the Game Boy. Here it has also made the transition into side-scrolling. It's much cuter. I think it stars a stubby Alan Grant. I mean, he's got his hat on this time at least. It's got dinosaur boss fights. You still collect key cards instead of uh, eggs. 
I don't know. I mean, they just kind of plop in front of you. It's a pretty run-of-the-mill platformer, but it's confidently built. I do enjoy the exploration of the other games, but this one has a lot less to complain about. It's a competent shooter and platforming game. And yeah, you still have to collect stuff, but you never have to go too far out of your way to get what you need. It's never really maze-like, so the aimless running around of the other games isn't a problem here. And like I said, it had dinosaur boss fights, which is badass! And hey, the theme from the original NES and Game Boy versions are also here. That's a nice touch. And that's it for the Nintendo games. But Ocean, as I discovered while making this video, actually had yet another version of this game on the Amiga and DOS systems. And that's this game. Being my first time playing this wasn't doing too well, and this is probably the weakest game we're going to be covering today. This is more of what I expect when playing movie tie-in games. Somewhat random enemy placement, the game just expects you to know how to do things, a lot of tedious time wasting, that, and the game completely shifts over to a first-person shooter segment in the second half of the game for no real reason at all. These inconsistent design choices are found everywhere in this game. I can go on for a bit, but the fact of the matter is, objectively, this is not a good game. This whole game's a mess, but that doesn't mean there isn't anything worthwhile. I really like how it looks, and that young dino dork in me gets excited seeing animals that I never got to see in the movie. And while the first person stuff kind of sucks, I've always had a soft spot for old school 3D gaming. It's kind of like seeing an official Jurassic Park Doom game, just not good. I don't know what the differences are between the Amiga and DOS versions, and I'm not going to pretend to know much about gaming on these since I didn't grow up with any of this stuff, but personally, I had a lot of fun discovering a Jurassic Park game. I never knew existed. And while we're talking about weird, bad Jurassic Park games on nonsense game machines, let's talk about Jurassic Park Interactive for the 3DO, which is... Hmm, where to begin? All right, so this is basically a bunch of lazy mini games and it kind of sucks. What kid on earth thinks of crap like this when they think of Jurassic Park? This version gets a lot of flack and for good reason. Nonsense mini games with no relevance to the franchise, knockoff actors, <laughs> why did they even bother? Look at these people, look how miserable they are. Not like in terror or you know anything that requires acting, just sheer boredom. This is quite possibly the most shallow gameplay experience of the entire lot of games we're looking at today. And well, well, this is the Game Apologist, and this is indeed a bad game, so let's find something good about it. With gaming where it's at today, it's hard to see some of that same appeal one would have had in 1993, but even in 2017, and this being my first time playing the game, I gotta tell you guys, I kinda love it. Honestly, for what this is, I really don't mind the game. They actually do a decent job justifying these strange minigames, namely by making you a security guard trying to hack into the park systems. And if you're familiar with the movie and Nedry with his annoying computer hacks, then you can see the inspiration here. They played up the computer lockout nonsense from the film real hard. And as goofy as that lockout screen was in the film, I can see how the developers could see Nedry spreading out that weirdness in everything he programmed. And having to conquer a computer virus by playing a boring but admittedly competent minigame seemed right up his alley. The main segments where you're confronted by one of the three predators aren't bad either. Bare bones, sure, but as a kid, this variety would have kept me more than entertained. You tase Dilophosaurus, not deep but very cathartic. You get chased down by a T-Rex, again easy stuff but still fittingly stressful. And the perspective isn't bad. I like that you only get a glimpse of this monster thanks to the rear view mirror. And the first person raptor segments creeps me right the hell out. This would have been unplayable to me as a kid. I was a total wimp. Any game with long, dark hallways? No thanks. And if the raptor gets you? Ugh. Now I can understand if you look at this and just roll your eyes, but whatever, this was impressive for 93. And again, I know I'm a sucker for early 3D graphics, but I really like how this thing looks. I was not expecting to like a minigame collection as much as I did with this game. That's the power of dinosaurs for you. Okay, we got Nintendo out of the way, we got the weird nonsense consoles nobody bought out of the way. Let's take a look at the other big chunk of Jurassic Park games provided by Sega. Here's the Game Gear version. I didn't grow up with this myself, but I knew it existed thanks to ads, and I wanted to play it so badly. Now I finally got the chance as an adult, and I gotta tell you, it's not bad. It took me a minute to get the hang of everything I could do, since I didn't have a manual and I was too lazy to look up anything on Google, but I got the hang of things relatively quickly. So you pick a section of the island and start off each level in a vehicle, where you blast the ever-living hell out of everything that gets near you. You can earn health upgrades and extra lives for the level ahead if your aim is true, and you'll have to fight against a boss dinosaur. But whether or not you win the encounter, you will then be dropped off into a more traditional platforming and shooting segment. This is somewhat generic, but considering the limitations of the machine, it's 
pretty impressive. You only have three weapons to work with, but you can select them at any time. And while the movement feels a little stiff, there's actually a wide variety of things you can do. You can latch onto overhanging branches or poles, shoot stuff, and well, I mean, that's about it, but it plays fine. The Game Gear version, like I said, is a pretty traditional shooting platforming game, but man, it's got dinosaur boss fights. That's awesome. Let's move on to Jurassic Park for the Sega Genesis. This was the version I easily spent the most time with growing up, and as such, this is my favorite of the entire set of games we're looking at today. Playing it now, I can easily understand if you'd prefer the gameplay of the Super Nintendo version, or yeah, even the portables. The platforming is rough, requiring far too many leaps of faith, and the layout of the levels is just hideous at times. The controls are stiff and slow, likely due to all the effort put into animating these extremely detailed sprites. I'm not gonna pretend I know anything about game development, but you can clearly see where the priority of this game is. But despite the flaws, I still absolutely adore this game. As a child, I wasn't nitpicking every single game I came across. I was in it for the dinosaurs. If you can make them look badass, that's all I needed. And look at these dinosaurs. Between this and the Sonic games, I simply did not believe people when they told me that the Sega Genesis was weaker compared to the SNES. I mean, how could it be? Blue Sky worked closely with the actual animators of the film itself and created some of the most stunning dinosaur sprites of the day. I mean, look at that Triceratops. Hey, buddy. Oh, oh, crap. The developers also gave the dinosaurs dynamic AI, meaning they'd be doing something different every single time you played, which actually explains a lot of confusion and tense moments in my childhood. And look at that T-Rex sprite. Good God. That thing is terrifying. I love it. The gameplay is not perfect, but it is manageable. It does take a lot of getting used to, and the platforming isn't super great, you're probably gonna die a lot, and there are no checkpoints, which can be very tedious. But there is a password system, levels aren't too long, and there are a lot of great moments in this game. But even after I thought I had all the enjoyment I could possibly get from this game, one fateful day, I finally decided to dick around with the other options, and to my immense surprise, discovered this. They let you take control of a Velociraptor. I freaked out. I get to play the best dinosaur ever? Are you kidding me? I'm sure it was advertised on the box, but I had no idea. This was a wonderful surprise for me. I spent so long playing as Alan Grant and had a lot of great fun with that, and blah, blah, blah. But now I get to play as one of the scariest parts of the adventure and get to chase down that bastard myself. The raptor feels so good after playing the wimpy little human. You can Mario the crap out of other animals, eat the compies for extra health, kill the crap out of park employees, jump stupid high. God, this is so cool. So yeah, maybe Jurassic Park on the Genesis isn't a perfect game, but there's a lot of genuine effort and creativity here. And you get to play a freaking raptor, which is just the best thing ever. And the Genesis version of Jurassic Park would also get its own sequel, called Rampage Edition. As a kid, I had no idea this was its own unique game. Didn't have a two in a title or anything like that. Thought this was just the same Genesis game with some tweaks. But I loved that game, so I asked for this for a birthday or a Christmas or something. And when I got it, I was in for another surprise. This was a full-on sequel. Rampage Edition is much more action-oriented. I mean, just look at this player select screen. Alan's gone from paleontologist to goddamn Rambo. And the quieter gameplay is just out the door, as dinosaurs will literally fling themselves at you. Oh my, it doesn't even have a jumping animation. It's just throwing sprites at me. This game doesn't even pretend like you sedate animals. Grant's just straight up killing them, even with tranquilizer darts. And like any good game, they blink right the hell out of existence once they're dead. They also added these thick black outlines to the characters, because, I don't know, I guess it's easy to get lost in all the chaos? Meh, I don't know. Gameplay's still not perfect, but it does feel a little bit better compared to the first game. The 4 life system is back, so you better sort out this island with just this. Otherwise, it's back to the start of the game. Even with these limitations, game's not that hard. I haven't played this since I was a kid, and I made it to the final stage without too many problems. They don't really tell you how to deal with the T-Rex in the final stage, so of course... <sighs> And of course, the raptor's back. Raptor's awesome. Raptor can somersault into a double jump. Never mind any of my other complaints. This game is perfect. Now, you think the fun would stop here, but they actually went out of their way to make another Jurassic Park game for the Sega CD. I wasn't kidding when I said they made a game for everything available at the time. You ever watch Jurassic Park and think to yourself, man, this would make for a fantastic mist-like point-and-click adventure game? No? Well, they did it anyway. And they're real proud of it, too, as a making of featurette and everything. You need a particular kind of patience and mindset for games like this. One that, unfortunately, I've never had myself. So I can't speak to how well this game works as a point-and-click adventure game. I keep stressing that navigation can be a pain for a lot of these games, but this game takes it to a whole new level. 
which is crazy considering you only have single screen backgrounds to deal with, but I've always managed to get lost and confused very quickly when playing this game. The Sega CD version doles out random tools to help you solve some very vague clues to work your way through this adventure. Some feel clever, most feel nonsensical, and along the way you'll get some dinosaur facts. Which is fun. Isn't that fun? I had no idea what the hell I was doing when I was a kid, but I still found this game very intriguing and very intimidating. Partially because the perspective made me feel like Raptor could jump out at any second and I couldn't do a thing about it. And partially because this game made me feel like a complete idiot. But it did have great ambiance for the day. For the limited capabilities I had to work with, I was always tense exploring the island. This game feels ambitious. It feels like it was doing its best to immerse you in this dangerous world, even though it was constrained to this CD add-on to a 16-bit gaming console. Hell, all of these games feel ambitious. Even the worst of the worst feels like they were trying to do something new, something different. Universal understood they had something big on their hands with Jurassic Park and spared no expense with these games. And yeah, we did have dinosaur games back then, Sure, probably more than I'm remembering, but most kinda sucked, and they only featured like three or four generic species, or dinosaurs were just relegated to a single theme level of a game that really had nothing to do with dinosaurs. Jurassic Park filled that void, and not only set a new bar for movies, but for licensed games as well. When it came to dinosaurs, Jurassic Park wanted to be the name you thought of, regardless of the medium you enjoyed these prehistoric creatures. And I feel like the care shows. I mean, just look at these toys. This is a generic dinosaur toy, and this is a Jurassic Park dinosaur toy. This property wanted to elevate itself above everything dinosaur related. Movies, toys, and yes, video games. So many of these developers set up to make something just as memorable as the movie it was based on. And in many cases, they're still great to play all these years later. These games could have so easily just been added to the ever-growing pile of crap license games. And these titles are just the ones that came out around the first Jurassic Park movie. There are still way more games to cover, and they get way more interesting than this. And yeah, the games aren't perfect, but but hell, the movie isn't either. I mean, look at these animals. They were supposed to be the most lifelike interpretations of these creatures we had ever seen, and they blatantly ignore well-known facts about these animals. The Dilophosaurus was a tall, late Jurassic carnivore, and in the movie it's this teeny little hopping squeak toy that sprays poison and does this lizard frill rattlesnake crap. Dinosaurs didn't spit poison? Why isn't being a dinosaur enough? And that's not a Velociraptor. That's possibly Deinonychus. Maybe a short Utah Raptor. Somewhere in between, but it's one of those two. Velociraptors were angry little turkeys, and the T-Rex could see just fine. Don't move. Can't see us if we don't move. And even if its eyes didn't work, why can't it just smell them? And on top of all of this, there isn't a single feather on any of these creatures. Their relation to birds is not a recent discovery. The movie itself even talks about how they were more closely related to birds than they were reptiles. I know a lot of dino nerds became annoyed at the liberties the novel and the movie took with these animals, but that's not exactly a new thing when it comes to Hollywood. And if you watch these films and just assume that there was a squeaking, poison spewing, frilly lizard hopping around the earth at some point, well I recommend reconsidering taking entertainment for fact and do a little bit of reading, because that's what little second grade Nick did after watching this movie. I didn't know what a raptor was before this film, and now the Deinonychus is my favorite dinosaur because of it. They took the liberties because it made the narrative more exciting. Velociraptors are called as such because it's a much more badass name. I mean the nickname alone is worth it, just doesn't work as well with a Deinonychus. You bred cusses? Nah, it doesn't work. And the Rex can't see moving prey just so they could add a buffer to its power, allowing Alan and the kids to be right next to this thing without being immediately gobbled down. And it made for one hell of a tense scene, arguably one of the most memorable scenes in film history. And the Dilophosaurus is so radically different from the real thing because the Rex and Raptor already fill a particular challenge for our protagonists. The more human-sized, agile, and intelligent Raptors provided a more personal kind of terror. I mean, look at those sneering, evil faces. These were the villains of the movie. Movie, not Nedry. <laughs> they didn't look hungry. They just looked like they wanted to murder the crap out of children. The T-Rex, on the other hand, couldn't care less. It was just this giant, powerful force of nature that would wreck anything that got in its way. If they had a normal Dilophosaurus, it would have just been this boring middle ground between the two other animals. So they changed it to this deceptively cute creature that had this terrifying transformation and a unique attack. And really, nothing it does is completely out of the ordinary for real animals. There are plenty of creatures who spit venom or frill out to become even more imposing. So I guess they at least took some sensible liberties with these animals. And none of the dinosaurs have feathers because nobody's afraid of giant birds. I'm sure you can make that design work, but this is how we saw dinosaurs for generations. Scales look badass, and honestly this is probably much easier to render in CG. You gotta remember, this was 1993. There were a lot of little design tricks to make these animals look as good as they did, and I guarantee having static scales helped with the process.
process. And on top of all this, all of these liberties and designs help define Jurassic Park. It's no longer just a T-Rex. This is a Jurassic Park T-Rex. This is a Jurassic Park Raptor, so on and so forth. They put their stamp on these animals, and I mean quite literally with the toys because that's what you need to do to stand out from the crowd. You can't trademark a Velociraptor, but you can change it enough so when people think of that animal, they think of your property. So no, it's not one-on-one -on -one with the real animal, but these creators aren't idiots. Spielberg doesn't need you telling him how T-Rex eyeballs actually worked. They clearly knew what they were doing. So what am I getting at here? This isn't the movie apologist. Well, as far as the movie liberties are concerned, they make these dinosaurs easy to adapt for multiple situations. No matter if it's a bird's eye view or a side-scrolling adventure, whatever the case may be, you're gonna have to tackle these animals in practically the same way. The Dilophosaurus will always be a long-distance projectile enemy. The raptor will always be a pain in the ass if it's up close and personal. And if the T-Rex shows up, well, things just got real. It's a threat so large that the best thing to do is just run away or distract it while you're making a Escape. The only times you will ever face it directly is going to be in a boss battle, and it's normally the last boss at that, being the ultimate challenge to conquer. The Jurassic Park games may be drastically different from one another, but the dinosaurs and their abilities are so well defined that you can plot them in any of these game styles and they'll work just fine. There are better platformers, there are better shooters, there are better adventure games out there. But if you love dinosaurs, if you love this movie, you'll be hard pressed not to find something to enjoy out of the set of games. And truth be told, I kind of prefer some of these games over the timeless classics they rip off. I know that's completely insane. Jurassic Park is not better than Doom, Zelda, or Myst. I understand how important those games are, how timeless, how brilliantly crafted, how well deserved of all the praise they may be, but some of them just don't speak to me. I'm just being honest with myself and honest with you guys. I just really like dinosaurs. I prefer to play an okay game featuring things that interest me than a great game that just bores me to tears. I mean, come on, honestly, I'm sure you can think of some cherished bits of media that you're simply not into or tired of hearing about. I understand how important Citizen Kane is to film, but I'd be happy never watching it again. It bored me to tears, and that's okay. All of these timeless games get enough praise as it is, and all of it is well deserved. But damn it, I love dinosaurs, and I wanted to play some dinosaur games, and I especially like them when I see some genuine care and ambition baked into the titles. I gotta respect how many different ways you can continue your adventure outside of this movie. I know they're just products for this multi-million dollar property, but I appreciate how much genuine when care was put into all this merchandising around the main course. Almost all of these were good games for their time, and they still hold up surprisingly well, even in the face of all the modern conventions we expect from our games today. So maybe they're not the best of the best, but they could have easily gone the same way as so many other movie games. That is one big pile of shit. And as we look to future games in this series, we will find even stranger genres they dip their sickle claws into. But that's for another time. Point is, you have a lot of options when it comes to playing around with these dinosaurs. And I don't think you can really go wrong with whatever you choose. The next time we look at this franchise, we'll be popping over to Site B. Because, oh boy, there's a lot to talk about there. But our time in the park has come to a close for the day. I hope you had as much fun as I did. <laughs> Hello there, I'm Nick. And this is The Game Apologist where we look for the good in bad games. Or in today's case, the game console, the Nintendo Wii U specifically. Thought it'd be a good time to take a look at this machine, as it has just recently released its final game. Or, well, final game anybody's gonna care about. The Legend of Zelda Breath of the Wild. Now, a few of you might be a little perplexed. Thought that new Zelda was for that newfangled Nintendo Switch. And it is out for that too. The launch of the console handheld hybrid starts an exciting new chapter in Nintendo's storied history. But like so many other Nintendo products, it is a little hard to find. So if you don't already own one, or you're a gamer like me, and owns the previous Nintendo box, and you just don't feel like shelling out another $300 just to play a game that runs perfectly fine on something you already own, well, it's a good time to reminisce on the gaming console that seemed doomed from the start. What on earth am I talking about? Well, let's jump back to 2011. The previous console generation had long overstayed its welcome at this point. The Xbox 360, PlayStation 3, and Nintendo Wii had been in housing since 2005, 2006, with no real end in sight. Consoles normally only stay on the market for about five years, and not even having word of what came next seemed a bit ridiculous at this point. Thankfully, Nintendo was ready to answer the call by announcing their successor to the insanely successful Nintendo Wii, with the Wii U. It would have released the following year and bomb. Real bad. Why though? The Wii brand sold Nintendo 100 million machines. The Wii U would share the same branding, and it'd be their first foray into the HD environment. What could 
possibly have gone wrong? I constantly see articles or listen to podcasts asking these very questions, when really there's no mystery to it at all. Now, I can only speak for myself, but I had more than a few reasons to not pick up the Wii U at launch. So right when they announced this thing, I immediately hated how it looked. Its new controller had a screen. That's not a handheld, mind you. That's just a controller. It looked unwieldy. It looked uncomfortable. It looked like a tablet made for play schoolers. And as it turned out, couldn't even be out of the same room as the main machine. So let's say you're sitting in your living room where you have your Wii U and HDTV set up and you're clogging up sewer pipes with the Mario Brothers. Suddenly nature calls. So you want to go clog the sewer pipes with your bowels, but continue your adventure with the Mario Brothers. Well, you won't be saving any princesses while dropping a deuce unless your TV is close enough to the bathroom and you just leave the door open, or you go to the trouble of connecting your console in the bathroom itself. But really, when it comes to that point, you're more likely going to be wondering what went wrong with your life instead of enjoying a video game. The lack of portability seems like a big, glaring design problem. Why on earth would they release the console in this state? Well, because of this. The Nintendo 3DS had been released only a year prior to the Wii U, and for the first time in the history of Nintendo handhelds, it wasn't flying off of store shelves. It was only after a severe price cut only six months into the life of the 3DS did this thing begin to pick up steam. Ever since the Game Boy, Nintendo had dominated the handheld gaming space. Now with the rise of mobile phones, not even Nintendo could guarantee success for they were once untouchable. Adding in a console that could potentially cannibalize 3DS sales after it had finally found success would be financial suicide. <laughs> So the portability of the gamepad clearly was not a priority. But even in that context, it just makes the Wii U sound even worse. Why on earth even make the thing at all? Well, consoles aren't made overnight. This thing was probably long in development. The money was probably already spent, and production was far too long to stop now. That, and despite how different Nintendo pretends to be, they are still a very proud, very stubborn, and very traditional video game company. They sure as hell weren't going to give up their place on the console market, even if the machine seemed half-baked and poorly thought out. So what's the point of this gigantic stupid controller if you can't even walk away from the TV. Well, it's got off-screen play, so if you live with someone else and they're trying to watch Netflix or play a better gaming machine, you can now move your game to your gamepad screen. Sometimes. It's not exactly consistent from game to game, because some games require both screens at once, and there isn't even a dedicated button to swap between the two screens, so you gotta sort out how to do that on a game to game basis. What I'm getting at is this controller seemed like a really stupid idea. Also, the launch games were... another Super Mario Bros. game. Yay. At this point, we had an excessive amount of new Super Mario Brothers. Hell, just a couple months prior, we got another one on the 3DS. We also got a generic looking zombie game, repackaged titles we had already bought on other machines, and were also severely discounted at that point. You could pay 10 to 20 bucks for Arkham City for PS3 or 360, or like $2 on Steam, or spend 50 so you can get the added gimmick of playing with your gamepad. Or hey, there's also Mass Effect 3, the notorious final chapter to an otherwise beloved trilogy. You know, the game series that had that nifty trick of bringing the exact same character and story choices from the first game all the way to the last? Yeah, let's just bring the final chapter to a brand new machine with no real way of bringing any of the old game stuff forward. This is so horribly thought out. And these are the games they brought over to appeal to hardcore gamers. The rest of the launch lineup was just usual stuff aimed at more casual audiences. And then they all came in these! Look at this teal nonsense. Did you pick a more preschool color for these boxes? Leapster doesn't even use teal, and they literally are for preschoolers. And the name of this machine was somehow even stupider than the last one. The Wii U. Wii U. What's that U even stand for? You might remember how the Wii name began to make perfect sense once you started hearing it as Wii. It was clear how much fun we all had playing together. But could it also be a perfect fit just for you? Absolutely. In fact, we're so convinced of it that we put that pronoun right in the name. Corporate buzzword nonsense, got it. You can certainly understand why they reused the Wii name, considering how insanely successful the last machine was, but Nintendo didn't seem to pay attention to the fact that all those sales were made in the first half of the Wii's life. And it turned out the motion controls, the Wii's big selling point, was normally the worst way to play games, unless it was specifically made for the Wii. So even if the Wii did have third-party support, the gamers weren't playing their games on the Wii, not when they had prettier, better controlling versions on other systems. Sure, grandmothers were playing the system, but they didn't need much outside of Wii Sports or Wii Fit, they weren't picking up Path of Radiance or Mad World to break up their yoga session.
This bland, safer everyone approach Nintendo took with the Wii burned a lot of the gaming community, and none of us were keen to see more of it, and apparently neither was the general public. 100 million units is a lot, but the Wii was not purchased by 100 million loyal Nintendo gamers. This thing was a fad, lightning in a bottle, but Nintendo thought they could make lightning strike twice, so they kept their stupid Wii name, added another goddamn vowel, and then pitched it to that casual audience, who at that point had moved on to gaming on their iPhones. But if that wasn't bad enough, the marketing of this thing was just a mess. Thanks to the name and the confusing messaging, the general public had no idea what this thing was supposed to be. Sounds like another attachment for the Wii, like the fitness board or the racing wheel. But the Wii was six years old at this point and probably sitting in an attic, or gosh, did we donate that to Goodwill? I can't ever remember. Even if a kindly Best Buy or GameStop employee explained that this was a brand new machine, who really cared? This was cool in 2006, but who wants to spend 300 bucks for more Wii Fit? Even if you were paying attention, even if you were a gamer interested in seeing what Nintendo was doing next, using the Wii name was basically Nintendo saying, we don't care about you. We got a taste of the larger market and we ain't going back. But no matter how many times Nintendo likes to pretend it's above its own industry, making pretentious statements like, we're not competing with PlayStation or Xbox, well, eventually that was gonna bite them in the ass because PlayStation and Xbox were certainly competing with them and they were more than happy to cater to that burned audience. Of course, Xbox had a bit big for their britches too, but not even the Xbox One is doing nearly as bad as the Wii U. It's still a success. Nintendo had given us a stupidly designed, stupidly named console with a giant ugly controller that had no purpose outside of the living room, charging 300 to 350 bucks for basically the same power in machines that were already on their way out, with a slew of dull, safe, or pointless launch games, only one of which took advantage of any of this machine's unique abilities, all sold with a confusing message that catered to absolutely nobody. All that is why I I didn't buy a Wii U at launch, but I did buy one eventually because of gold squiggly lines. Okay, so my wife gave me endless shit when I first picked up my Wii U. All they really did with the machine is add a bunch of gold squiggles on there and slap the Zelda logo and I was good to go. Because I am a sucker for special editions, I am a Zelda fan, and to be completely honest with you, I was looking for any excuse to like this machine. I'm sure a lot of us gamers were. So when Nintendo announced an HD version of my favorite Zelda game, put it on the Wii U, gave it its own special edition machine, I figured to myself, well, it's now or never, this thing's not doing too well, and if I'm gonna get any version of the machine might as well be this one. It's gonna be hard as hell to find later. So despite all my misgivings, I finally threw down the cash and picked up a Wii U. And to my surprise, it was a much better system than I originally anticipated. Now, initial reveal of this ridiculous controller aside, it actually sits in your hands better than you'd expect. It is large, yes, but it's not a pain in the ass to hold like the original Xbox controller. I spent hours playing games with this thing with no problems whatsoever. And it's surprisingly light. It doesn't feel cheap, but it's not heavy either. It won't be a strain to hold if you have long gaming sessions. It does still look like a toy, but that's not entirely a bad thing. Nintendo does skew towards younger audiences, but because of that, they tend to make sturdier systems. And despite how light it is, the gamepad feels like a sturdy controller. Like I said, I've played plenty of games with this thing just fine. Never even bothered getting myself a pro controller. But hey, that's certainly an option too. The Wii U offers a ridiculous amount of controller customization, and all of your old Wii mokes function just fine. Hell, even your old Wii library plays on this machine, and upscales it as well. And I've always been a fan of backwards compatibility. It's nice to have some extra games to play right out of the box. And while I'm speaking of the controller, I gotta admit the off-screen feature is convenient depending on your living situation. I've been able to play a lot more games and still sit around with my wife without her being bored out of her mind. And the games that do take advantage of both screens, while there aren't many, have made it very convenient. Being able to look down at maps and inventory without pausing the action has been surprisingly convenient. And while Nintendo's online has never been perfect, the Miiverse is considered one of the best online console communities to date. They don't charge you for it, and the tablet makes it quick and easy to play stamps, doodles, and notes in various parts of game communities. I've actually had a lot of fun with it myself. Self, and I normally don't bother with this stuff. I've always enjoyed seeing notes after a Mario level or picking up bottled messages in Wind Waker. These weird, non-invasive ways of communicating with each other are just the kind of thing you'd expect from Nintendo. The Wii U is still weird, and I don't feel it was very well thought out, but nothing about the hardware feels cheaply made, and the failure rates for these things are nowhere near as bad as other machines. I've had to replace a 360, PS3, PS4, but so far my Wii U's been running just fine, and it's not from a lack of use either, because despite whatever good or bad you can take away from the machine itself, all that truly matters are the games. Now, third-party support for this machine is... was practically non-existent, but Nintendo, despite their stupid gimmicky hardware designs, knows how to make some killer games, and thankfully, the Wii U is no slouch in this category. Now despite how meager this library may seem to people, some of these games are quite heavy with content, and there are more than you'd think, so I'm going to cover a few of these as quick as possible, but if I miss any, well, sorry. Here are some of the more interesting games on the Wii U.
The Legend of Zelda Wind Waker HD. This game originally released in 2003 on the GameCube. And while I don't know if it's exactly okay to charge 50 bucks for a 10 year old game, for what it is, it's aged wonderfully. The sense of discovery and adventure is unmatched. The art direction is timeless and gorgeous. The combat is as smooth as butter. Hell, it was so good it was reason enough for me to pick up a Wii U. Still, I don't know if it's enough to charge for 50 bucks, but considering what the game meant to me, I was fine with the price tag. And hell, it's only 20 bucks these days brand new, and it's certainly worth that. This is the definitive way to play Wind Waker, and is still hands down my favorite of the series. Super Mario 3D World like the Wii U itself, 3D World is this weird and decisive thing, standing in the middle of the road, not fully committing to one thing or the other. In this case, whether or not to play like a 2D or 3D Mario game. I feel like this is what gamers would have expected Mario to evolve into once he made the jump into 3D back in 96. Well, if Nintendo hadn't been so innovative with Mario 64. And by that, I mean it has the more linear bite-sized levels of the 2D games, but with 3D movement. And cat suits. But also like the Wii U, this game still works in this middle ground to the very best of its ability. Gameplay is great, it's a lot of fun, and it's just... Oh God, look at this thing. Now it's not the best 2D Mario, and it's not the best 3D Mario, but it is still Mario, which means you're gonna have one hell of a polished game on your hands. And for me, it's absolutely a must own for the machine. Donkey Kong Chunky Tropical tre Trees. Freeze. Donkey, donkey chunks, donkey chunks, chunky dunks, topical cheese. The sequel to Retro Studios' revitalized take on the Donkey Kong Country series, except now you can use real buttons instead of that stupid waggle nonsense. The game is gorgeous, tightly designed, and tough as hell. The Wii U turned out to be the home for some stellar platformers, and this is definitely one of the best of them. Wonderful 101, a crazy, colorful, and charming action game from the folks at Platinum, and one I'm worried will end up stranded on the Wii U. I haven't played much of the game myself, but all I have is as crazy as you'd expect from this developer. It's like a Pikmin of action games, I guess, kind of. It's weird, go play it. Bayonetta 2. And speaking of Platinum, here's a sequel to the woefully overlooked Bayonetta. I know a lot of people gripe about it not showing up on Sony or Microsoft's machines, but you gotta appreciate that this game exists at all. And that wouldn't have happened without Nintendo. And thank god it does exist, because this is one of the best combo-based action games out there. Pikmin 3. It skipped the console generation, but Nintendo's weird little strategy game series came back in glorious HD on the Wii U. And it's mostly more of the same. Considering how solid the gameplay is, that's never a bad thing. Pokémon Tournament, a Pokémon fighting game from the folks behind the Tekken series. It's as bonkers as it sounds. Splatoon. Now we already know a sequel is hitting the Switch, and for good reason. Nintendo's first foray into the multiplayer shooter scene was wildly unique. In a world overrun with military shooters, Nintendo instead made you play a kid who could turn into a squid and then swim in paint. Yeah, it's way more popular than you'd expect. I feel like this game was all anybody was talking about during the summer it was released, which is surprising considering the Wii was already considered a failure at this point. It was nice to see Nintendo making some bold decisions on a machine already considered a flop, and Splatoon ended up being one of the crown jewels of the Wii U. Star Fox Zero. You know, let's just leave that for another episode. Sonic Lost World. Yeah, we should probably save this for its own episode as well. But I will say this about the Wii U version. Sure, it's been ported to PC and you can play it on there, but that one doesn't have the Yoshi or Zelda levels. And that's awesome. Super Smash Bros. Wii U. Well, if I wasn't gonna pick up this machine for Wind Waker, I sure as hell would have done it for Smash Bros. Because I love me some Smash Bros. A bigger roster than ever, gorgeous HD graphics, and finely tuned between the floaty, casual-friendly brawl and the hyper-hardcore melee. Wii U's addition to the Nintendo Mashup Fighter might be the most perfect perfect version of this game to date. They even released a GameCube controller adapter so you could play the game with the same tried and true controls we've been using since 2001. Tokyo Mirage Sessions. When it was announced that a Shin Megami Tensei and Fire Emblem crossover game was going to happen, I don't think any of us really knew what to expect. A dungeon crawling RPG, sure, but maybe not one solely focused on J-pop. I don't really know what to make of this game. I haven't played a whole lot of it myself and it's not really my kind of game. But for the people this does appeal to, it's incredibly well done. As you'd expect from a fusion from such respected series. Kirby and the Rainbow Curse. Yes, I know this thing is stupid cute, but damn do I love the art aesthetic of this game. This unique claymation look just goes to show that Nintendo can do some amazing things, even with underpowered hardware. And this game isn't just a looker, it does hide quite a bit of challenge. All you really do is guide little ball Kirby along with these colorful little rainbow ropes that you create with your stylus. My only real gripe about that is you're going to be forced to use the gamepad a lot of the time, when the colors really pop on a big screen. That aside, it's still a lot of fun, and if you were a fan of the DS original, I highly recommend you check out the sequel. Yoshi's Woolly World. And speaking of cute yet challenging games, here's Woolly World. Now here's the thing about the Yoshi games. Yoshi's Island, the technical sequel to Super Mario World, is hands down one of the the best platformers out there. All of the sequels though, 
Yeah, we'll likely be covering them at some point. They're mediocre to okay most of the time. That is, until we get to Wooly World. I don't think any of us really expected that much out of this game, but here we are. It's the best Yoshi game since Yoshi's Island way back on the Super Nintendo. The game is cute as hell, the aesthetic is creative and beautiful, and it does, like Kirby, hide a deceptive amount of challenge and varied gameplay. They did just recently port this out to the 3DS, and maybe it could eventually make its way to the Switch, but right now this is still the best way to experience this game, and it does still feel great on that giant gamepad. Zombie U. Yes, it has a dumb name, and yes, it has been recently re-released on the PS4 and Xbox One, but I'd still recommend the Wii U version. This is a pretty kick-ass zombie game, if you give it a chance, and a surprisingly hardcore exclusive launch for a Nintendo system. This game has you take some random schmuck through the undead streets of London in a desperate bid for survival, and has a fairly novel mechanic, in the sense that once you die, you don't restart with the same character. You get a whole new meat bag with an entirely different backstory. You still have the same objectives, but if you want all of your old inventory back, you're gonna have to track down the now zombified remains of your former character. It's metal as hell. Also, I don't know if they implemented this at all in the PS4 Xbox One versions, but a neat feature for the Wii U was how the game forced you to use the gamepad screen as your bag's inventory in real time, meaning you'd have to look down at your gamepad slash bag, but keep looking up at the screen to make sure the zombies weren't sneaking up on you while you looted around for stuff. There was no pausing or taking a break from this stuff, and just added to the tension. That and modern London just isn't explored a whole lot in games. It's nice to see a more unique metropolitan area even if it's, well, gone to shit. Paper Mario Color Splash. Now, I know a lot of fans haven't enjoyed these games quite as much as the GameCube release, and honestly, I haven't spent a whole lot of time with this one myself, but it still packs a whole lot of charm, still plays really well, and again, Nintendo goes to show that you can do some amazing things with the graphics despite being on a weaker machine. From what I understand, this is way better than Sticker Star, so you got that going for you as well. I can't say a whole lot more because, again, I haven't played a lot of it myself, but I'm definitely going to be coming back to this one. Super Mario Maker. This is a game that should have been out the door with the launch of the Wii U. Instead, the killer app for the machine came out long after it was deemed a failure. The game takes full advantage of the Wii U gamepad, something that few games ever did. The idea is simple enough. You take the template from one of the four main 2D Mario games and build a level with all the tools at your disposal. Now, building your own level in a game is nothing new, and Little Big Planet on the PlayStation built their entire brand on the ability to make your own platforming levels. But unlike those games and so many others, Mario Maker takes what is normally a complex, tedious, and time consuming chore and made it as fun as playing the game itself. Nintendo finally found an ingenious use for the gamepad, which was an indisposable tool in level creation thanks to the ease of the touchscreen and easy to navigate toolset. Even if you aren't the creative type, you could potentially play brand brand new Mario levels every single day thanks to the online community. That and you could bring in the Sonic sprite if you had an amiibo, so I love that. I love that a whole lot. It's really no wonder that so many players still play their Wii U every day just because of this game. It's that good. Mario Kart 8. Now, the updated version of this game has already been announced for the Switch, and if you gotta choose between the two, probably go with that one. Still, gotta give props for the hell of an experience that this game gave to so many owners of the Wii U. Now, I have to admit, I'm more of a Smash guy, and I can't really tell the differences between all the different versions of Mario Kart. What I do know is that this is one hell of a game. It's well made, gorgeous, and a damn good time. Our friends from Chicago still pop this in every single time they come down to visit, and I certainly understand why this is getting the port to the Switch. It's well deserved. But if you don't have a Switch and you somehow haven't played this game on your Wii U, go check it out. And that's all I have for Wii U games for now. Yes, there are more, and yes, there's still one big exception I haven't talked about yet, but I'm gonna be saving that for part two. So check back soon because I will have the second episode where I do talk about Zelda and wrap up my thoughts on this machine. And I promise you it'll come out much quicker than this one did. Till next time, go enjoy some games on the Wii U. Hello there, I'm Nick. And this is The Game Apologist, where we look for the good in bad games. Or, uh, bad versions of good games? Good games on bad systems? Whatever. This is part two of The Last Breath of the Wii U, which I decided to split up because, unlike the first part, where I briefly mentioned a handful of games, sorry for missing a couple, I wanted to focus on just one title for this particular episode. The Legend of Zelda Breath of the Wild, the killer launch title for the Nintendo Switch, and the swan song for the Wii U. Since this is the last game Nintendo will release for its notorious system, and also apparently being inferior to the Switch counterpart, we're going to be taking a closer look at the Wii U edition of this game. Yes, I know that's a pathetic excuse to cover Zelda BOTW, especially considering the purpose of the show. There are far more deserving titles in this franchise we should be covering. Uh, I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't, but my flimsy excuse is all I have, and I'm gonna cling on to it like Link clings on to the side of uh, uh, everything. Look, this game consumed a month of my life, and I have to get something productive out of those countless hours. Just, just let me have this. 
All right. Before we go any further, I should probably stress a few things. I'm still new to this YouTube thing and I'm still finding my voice. And if you haven't seen any of the other episodes or haven't caught on to this particular format, I generally lay out the history and negativity in the first half of an episode and then spend the second half talking about the positive aspects of a game or game related device or topic. Now, some of you might be thinking, well then why are you bothering to cover this game at all? There's not a single negative thing about it. It's one of the greatest games ever made. Hmm. Well, I can take a contrarian view on a controversial title, or at the very least play devil's advocate for someone else, because the negative opinion is generally considered the norm for that particular subject. I don't think the negatives can exist in a vacuum. Someone out there is bound to love something everyone else hates. But I also feel that positivity cannot exist in a vacuum either. While I normally play apologists to a game, I also feel the need to point out when a game gets too many apologists. I do come to the defense of bad games, and I honestly love some pretty bad games, sure, but that doesn't mean I feel like you should dismiss a critical look at the flaws in a title. It's these flaws that help improve a game series, or at the very least help developers improve their skills for their next project. It's these flaws that give the consumer a voice, that lets developers and publishers know that certain things are not okay. We don't want glitchy games, we don't want online passes, we want to love this thing you gave us, and here's what you can do to improve your product and in turn, your business. While I feel that Zelda BYOB is a phenomenal game, I do feel like a lot of games journalists, especially Especially from the larger outlets, gloss over some pretty glaring issues. And again, this is a part two for a reason. So with all of that said, like every other episode, I'm going to start off with the negatives. So if you have a hard time listening to someone whine about your perfect little game, well buckle in Nintendo fans, because I've got an extra. God. Damn it! we've known about and have been waiting for this one game for years. Long before we even knew what the Switch was, this was the game that would finally make the Wii U relevant, the saving grace of a failing console. Back in 2014, when we finally got a chance to see the briefest glimpse of this thing in action, I was excited as hell, as were many of us. It was bright and gorgeous. It had the promise of an open world Hyrule, moving away from the more linear console entries we got in years prior. They didn't really show a whole lot, but what we got left us with many questions. Why is there a giant robot? Why does Link have an arrow made by Iron Man? Why is he wearing blue? Hell, is this Link even a boy? So many questions, and we wouldn't see this thing again until the Game Awards later that year, where they'd finally show us some gameplay. Off-screen gameplay, but whatever, it teased some cool features. It was nice to see them evolve the gamepad features we saw in the Wind Waker port. Finally, we would get a proper HD Zelda that took advantage of the Wii U's capabilities. But again, they didn't give us much in the way of actual information, but that's fine. They promised a 2015 release. Are you sure that this will be released next Next year. Yes. All of the staff members are working together and doing their best. This was December 2014. We wouldn't have that long to wait till March 3rd, 2017. So yeah, we had to wait a little longer than expected. 2015 came and went, and instead of a game release, they showed us more grass. As time went on, Wii U releases slowed down to an embarrassing trickle, giving us little to tide over until the release of this mysterious Zelda U. And as 2016 rolled in, we began wondering if it would even release before the new NX. This mystery machine Nintendo just casually announced in a board meeting. Time rolled on and Zelda U became Breath of the Wild and the NX became the Switch in January of 2017. Yeah, we didn't get an official reveal of this new machine until two months before its launch. And suddenly what was once the best reason to buy a Wii U became the best reason to buy a Switch. Yeah, you could buy the game on the machine that it was originally designed for, but come on, why would you do that when you can spend hundreds of dollars on this exciting new toy? Even though it'll be half a year before we give you anything remotely this robust. Doesn't that sound familiar? What was once the most important release for the Wii U became an afterthought. The story was spun to the point that news outlets made it sound like Wii U ownership be grateful we even got this game at all. Yeah, how dare we support Nintendo's stupid machine. And it didn't stop there. Nintendo did everything in its power to get you to associate Zelda with the Switch. All of the marketing for the machine prominently featured Zelda. The release date for the Switch and Zelda were on the exact same day. They made a special edition and a super rare, super valuable master edition for the game, but only for the Switch version. But hey, at least both versions would get a season pass. Yay. But hell, even that features a Nintendo Switch t-shirt. Seems a bit silly to put that tacky t-shirt advertising Nintendo's new toy in this fantasy world, doesn't it? Seems sort of redundant to advertise this to gamers who already own a Switch. Well, buddy, that t-shirt ain't for you. That's for the poor sap still playing it on the Wii U. A console on life support. That t-shirt is Nintendo telling you to pull the plug. All of this and more built a narrative that pushes people to buying a Switch for the game. That this is clearly the superior way to play the game. And the Wii U version, the inferior way. So we have to ask, 
is it worth picking up a Switch for this game if you already own a Wii U? This answer will be different depending on your particular lifestyle and when you see this video. As of right now, the game and the Switch are still pretty new, and because of that, there are a few problems I have. Right now, you really don't have much to play on the Switch outside of Zelda. Mario Kart and Splatoon will be here soon, and you do have a lot of indies, but really, outside of some extras, there's not much here you haven't already experienced on the Wii U or other platforms. I guess you got 1-2 Switch and Bomberman, but those are currently 50 bucks, which is insane because those are not $50 games. Outside of this crappy launch, all of the Switch accessories are so expensive. You have to spend $70 just to get a controller with decent sized buttons. And the machine itself is a pain in the ass to find currently, because this is Nintendo and low volume releases are just their thing. Besides, launch systems always have annoying hiccups. The Switch is no exception. Wonky left Joy-Cons, dead pixels, docks that leave marks on your machine. Yeah, no thanks. I'll leave that for the early adopters. But really, those are just my personal gripes with the way Nintendo rolls out their supply. What about the actual game? Is there anything that makes the Wii U version of Zelda truly inferior? Honestly, kind of. I've played some of this game on the Switch, and it seems to run fine. It's beautiful, it controls like you'd expect, and the appeal of playing this game anywhere sounds fantastic. I completely understand the appeal of this machine and this version of the game. And outside of taking advantage of the Switch's portability, this version also has some perks on the technical side of things. The Switch version of Zelda has a better resolution and from what I'm told, a more consistent frame rate than the Wii U version. I'd be lying to you if I said I didn't see some frame rate drops at least three separate times near the end of my adventure on the Wii U version. For a vast majority of my time, this was not an issue in any noticeable way, but it did happen, so there you go. If you haven't played this game yet, Nintendo did just patch both versions of this game, and from what I've read, it seems to be a noticeable improvement. So really, with that patch, the only real difference is the fact that the Switch version runs at 900p when docked. But that's about it. Despite what you may have heard otherwise, Zelda runs great on the Wii U. Maybe it runs at a lower resolution? I, I can't really tell. This game isn't exactly cutting edge in the graphics department either way. It still plays and runs great on the Wii U, and as far as I can tell, it's practically identical to the Switch counterpart, outside of those minor things I mentioned anyway, which you're probably not even going to notice unless you're trying to make an excuse to get yourself a Switch. And yes, I've seen the graphic comparison videos, but I'm really not seeing a massive difference here, guys. Oh, but if you pay close attention to the shadows, the grass frame rate drops a little bit, the colors on the models are a little sharper. Shut up, it's the same damn game. If you want it on the go, if you really want a Switch, Fine, that's completely understandable. But if you already own a Wii U, guys, I really don't see the need to spend another 300 bucks. You're gonna get the same experience. And if a minor tweak in resolution bothers you that much, well, buddy, I don't know what you're doing on a Nintendo machine in the first place. But I'm not gonna lie to you and say that the Wii U is the superior version. That simply doesn't seem to be the case, even on a minor technical level. But the more I researched, the more I looked back on these three years of promotion and hype, the inferiority of the Wii U version feels intentional. I rewatched the gameplay reveal just to be sure I had my facts straight about the release date promises and found myself irritated. I wasn't really sure why, but then I realized it's because of that damn map. They had, at some point, gamepad integration with this game, and at some point they removed it. Now the touchscreen is just a glorified off-screen play button. All you can do is transfer your gameplay from your screen to your controller. But it is important to note, we knew the gamepad features were removed before launch, and they did address it. In an interview with IGN, the game's director said, when we were developing the game for the Wii U, we had touch features implemented as you have seen. Once we began to develop the game in tandem for the Switch, we aimed to provide the same gameplay experience across both on Switch and Wii U. In doing our testing without the touch features, we noticed looking back and forth between the gamepad and the screen actually took a little something away from this type of Zelda game. Without the touch features, it actually turned out to be a really strong gameplay experience. There was no hesitation or reluctance in removing these features because we felt the way it is now is the best way to play the game. That makes sense! You've only heavily implemented and heavily advertised these features on four previous Zelda games, four games that are considered masterpieces in their original forms, and are now considered the definitive ways to play said masterpieces, largely thanks to the convenience provided by the second screen. In fact, I seem to be having a hard time finding any review complaining about this. All of these games released on systems that have two screens. I mean, Nintendo's been using this design since 2006, you know? The DS? The best-selling family of handhelds in all of gaming history? A design so so successful they continued to use it in their sequel system and even brought it over to the home console market? Weird how only now, after announcing this game and leaving people in anticipation for nearly the entire existence of the Wii U, only now that the system is considered a failure and a new machine, one that doesn't have two screen functionality, do you guys discover it's actually a detriment to the player? How very kind of you. Thank you so much for looking out for us.
I don't quite buy it, is what I'm saying. He can't outright say it, but obviously Nintendo did not want the Wii U version to have any discernible advantage over the Switch release. Considering how useful the gamepad was in the other two Zelda games on the Wii U, considering how it was clearly originally intended for this game as it was one of the first things they showed off after the reveal, the stupid amount of time you spend in your inventory in the final product that could have easily been mitigated by the gamepad, the ridiculously long delays since the game's reveal, and considering that when it was finally released, how it downplayed the Wii U version in favor for a new system that, I'm gonna be honest, with you feels a little rushed to market, it doesn't take a genius to assume that the Wii U version, the original version, was massively gimped because of the release of the Switch. And yes, I know, Nintendo's a business and blah 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 blah, that's not the consumer's problem. They still screwed over the fan base that bought a Wii U that waited for years only to be pushed aside and given an inferior product. I'm sure there were more than a few people who bought a Wii U in anticipation for this game alone. Nintendo fans, you can jump to the defense of this multi-billion dollar corporation all you want, but you're the ones getting screwed over here. But hell, the game's still fantastic. I mean, people paid to tell you how good a game is are throwing perfect scores at this thing like it's the second coming of Ocarina. And I kind of have a problem with that. I don't think I can agree with giving this game a perfect score. I certainly think it's too early to declare this one of the greatest games of all time. Breath of the Wild is a defining moment for the Legend of Zelda series, and the most impressive game Nintendo has ever created. Okay, calm the hell down. I gotta say, I'm somewhat concerned with how dismissive some of these journalists are about some flaws in this game. Yes, I'm sorry, I'm not done bitching yet. Oh boy, I better get my flame shield up for this one. Oh, son of a- the graphics are fine for the technology running them, but they're kind of bland up close and they look 10 years old. There are times I thought the map was needlessly large, just spacing out all the traditional Zelda stuff between a lot of traveling. And like I said, a lot of these bold new things Nintendo put into this game have been done for years, and sometimes better, in other games. And oh my god, these motion control puzzles, are you kidding me? This crap is broken! How are these puzzles okay to do? This game is so polished, but the motion controls are inexcusably bad. You know how to solve it, you know what position to put this stupid thing in, but the motion controls are so inconsistent that you're going to be physically flipping the machine in your hands, moving your body around, or constantly resetting the puzzle in hopes that this time it'll calibrate properly. Sometimes it goes clockwise, sometimes it goes counterclockwise, sometimes it just stops turning halfway through. It's just a damn mess. Oh and yes, oh my god, you flipped over the entire board. How brilliant of you everyone ever. God. Damn, does this game feel tedious at times. Anyone else do that one quest where you have to carry a blue flame from one mountain to the other? God forbid if you don't have a torch, or this is happening during a constant rainstorm like I had, making this stupid simple quest take up an hour of my time. And yeah, it rains a lot in this game. And it's cute how it affects your climbing. And yes, they give you a cute little weather forecast in the corner. But good God, it is such a pain in the ass if you're trying to get anywhere. And you better have arrows. Yes, they're expensive and tough to come by early in the game, but you better have a constant supply because otherwise you're gonna have to mark your map and come back to some shrines later and oop, broke your bow. Way to go, idiot. Oh, and the ending sucks. Spoilers. Look, I know it's hard telling a story in a big open world game, but that doesn't mean it's impossible to weave a compelling narrative, even if most of it is optional. And it's not like they didn't have the potential to tell a great story. The premise alone is incredibly compelling. I was genuinely intrigued by this Link waking up after a hundred year stasis. I couldn't wait to uncover more of this mystery and uh, oh, uh, well, they just kind of tell you everything right before you jump off the Great Plateau. Seriously, even as you uncover memories or defeat dungeons, there really aren't any more plot points or twists to uncover. They do develop these characters a bit, and I appreciate that, but it's just not enough. I mean, hell, I even like these characters. Zelda, Falco, Darunia 2, Jailbait Fish, and... Hello, what's happening here? Maybe the plot is secondary to the exploration, but they were clearly trying to make you care about these people and their plight. Why else add voice acting? Well, a sprinkling of voice acting. A dash of voice acting. A hint of voice acting. It's so infrequent and it's so bland that it might as well not even be there. I'm just tired of people making excuses for this narrative when Witcher 3 and Red Dead exist. Whether or not you find all the plot photos, everything still must converge and come to an end at some point. You still have plenty of chances to tell a grand tale. There are more detailed open worlds with better characters and a wider variety of things to do. Better side quests with better stories that lead to greater, or at least, more diverse rewards. Oh shoot, I wonder what the- oh yay, another spirit orb. Or a rupee or a sword that's gonna break in three minutes. These weapons are so damn fragile. This sword has been sitting here for a hundred years just fine. Why can't I get more than a couple smacks in against a big cobs, cob, goblin, 
Hoboken. You can even break these special one-of-a-kind treasured weapons you have to work your ass off for. But don't worry, you have the honor of playing with it again as long as you have a ridiculous set of materials and go to this one point on the map and talk to this one person. Even then, isn't this just a copy? It's not even the original thing. There's only one weapon that doesn't break. Guess which one that is. With your wimpy weapons, you're going to be constantly using your inventory screen. I mean a lot. You can use your d-pad to slightly speed up the process, granted, but you still have to pause the game to select the weapon or the shield, or if you want to use a specific specific bow or a specific arrow, you have to use that same button prompt, but be sure to press down the bow trigger first, otherwise you'll bring up the sword and shield menu again, and oh, it's just a mess. And it doesn't stop there. You have to use this inventory to eat, to pick up your ingredients to cook, swap out your clothes, use your map, check your photo album. That last one sounds stupid, but since this game locks cutscenes and plot details behind finding the exact spot on the map in one of these 12 pictures, man, it sure would have been really convenient to use the gamepad to compare the photo against the surroundings with, wouldn't it? Or slight spoilers, how all four of the dungeons require you to open up the map screen so you can manipulate a function that you constantly need to use in order to get to the boss? Golly gee, it's almost as if this stuff was designed to be used in tandem with a secondary screen! You could cut away so much wasted time if you could use any of this stuff on the fly. This is why I consider the lack of gamepad functionality a knock against the game. This game was clearly designed to use it. You seriously think they designed the Sheikah Slate to remind you of a Switch? I'm sure the final design is an aesthetic nod and a nice reminder to go buy one if you haven't already, but come on guys, this is supposed to be a freaking gamepad. Pad. The slate was clearly designed to act as a second screen for the gamepad. And god damn, how immersive would that little gimmick have been? I know plenty of you are gonna feel like that's not fair. That I shouldn't bitch about the lack of features when the rest of the game is so well made, but that's not the point. My point is that there is so much missed potential here, both in the game and with the system it was originally created for. This game was robbed of anything that gave the Wii U any sense of identity. The Switch is awesome, and I'm glad it's here. But while I feel it is basically the final evolution of the Wii U, that doesn't mean the Wii U doesn't have qualities that make it a worthwhile system on its own. Sure, it's basically an oversized DS you have to keep connected with your television, but there were still fun and unique methods of gameplay that you couldn't find anywhere else thanks to this oddball design. Nintendo has made plenty of questionable choices with hardware designs, and I won't argue that it feels like it's trying too hard at times, but you can't argue that their games tend to bring out the very best of these crazy machines. We clearly had a game that evolved the little ideas they tease us with in the Wind Waker and Twilight Princess ports. Great games that were made even better thanks to this machine. Breath of the Wild could have been, should have been, the justification for this gargantuan controller. I mean look at this, why can't you just grab a weapon off your screen? I mean hell, they could have at least had Link automatically grab his next weapon after his current one broke, or at the very least slap a Hoboken, but considering how fragile everything else is, I can't really blame him. <laughs> How much more intense would these fights have been if you couldn't take a breather? If you had to select your next weapon on the fly, or your food, or your armor, all without pausing in the middle of the action? Because that breaks immersion. Not looking down at your gamepad. That adds another layer of challenge. Maybe this doesn't sound like much to you, but considering the hours and hours you'll sink into this game, this would have become second nature. This would have been a natural extension of that button layout, and a reason to own the Wii U. And now, it's the only Nintendo system without its own unique Zelda game. I think, anyway, I should probably double check that. I know I'm being nitpicky, I know this sounds super salty, and I know the show is called Game Apologist, but good lord, some of these reviews by people who are relied upon to tell you what's good and bad about a game just completely skim over some of this shit. Or briefly mention something as if it doesn't matter, or they all just spout the same crap over and over like they've never seen a game before. Do you see that tower way off in the distance? You can go there. If you can see it, chances are you can reach it. As Link approaches a cliffside and you see the massive world surrounding you, knowing that you can traverse every single foot of that terrain. How is that impressive to anybody in 2017? Yes, this game is bold and new by Zelda standards, but come on, what have you guys been playing between these releases? I mean, you've had three years alone to play stuff since this game was announced. For God's sakes, Skyrim and Dark Souls was doing so much of this stuff, and that was released the same year as the last big console Zelda. When I started Breath of the Wild, it all felt like a diet version of Witcher 3, Nintendo's baby steps into the modern market. At least, that's how I felt when I started the game. Because despite how butthurt I am about the gamepad features, despite the fact that I don't feel it's a perfect game, I gotta tell you, it got its hooks in me too. There are things I absolutely love. Things that help elevate the series to the pedigree it deserves. Things that harken back to the golden days of the series and remind us why it became a household name. And yes, things that redefine what it means to be an open world game. In a gaming generation up to its ears in open world games. 
Yes, I'm finally done complaining. I still haven't completely come around on some of my many complaints, but it's not my job to slap a review score on this thing, and there will always be annoying crap to deal with in any game. I could just shrug this crap off and enjoy myself. Let me address some of my own complaints I made in this video before anyone jumps down my throat. First off, while I'm still not happy about the gamepad stuff, to be completely honest with you guys, I didn't mind playing this game like any other traditional game with inventory management. Pressing pause and taking your time organizing your crap or planning your next location is nothing new for games. And I can't be the only one who finds that a little relaxing. And while the voice acting and storytelling feels achingly safe and bland, the calm, quiet dialogue fits with the tone this world and story are trying to set. I am one of those advocates for spoken dialogue in this series, and I'm incredibly happy they're finally letting the series grow up a little bit. I'm not saying it needs to have gore or be super dark and moody, but I do believe that if Nintendo wants to make a more story and character driven experience, even if it's secondary, if they're wanting to tell a narrative that's supposed to invoke a bit of drama, anything that's supposed to make me care about these people, then they need to make them feel a little more alive. And not having voices just because that's the way we've always done it is not good enough for me. I hope they don't slink back into old habits. I want them to keep pushing forward and do even more. Cutscenes in a modern day AAA video game that you have to read your way through is just silly. And yeah, I am all for Link speaking, but I've managed to these games just fine with our mute little Legolas. He just comes off as a polite, if not socially awkward elf boy. And they even try to justify his silence if you go reading through a particular diary. I mean, at least they try to address it, I guess. Speaking of the story, I have to admit, Nintendo brilliantly hid some very important points, even with all the pre-release promotions and trailers. A lot of this is still traditional Zelda, but they still played with my expectations. I was worried the trailers were showing me far too much, but man, looking at them now, knowing what I know, good job, Nintendo. Zelda herself has fantastic characterization, again, in terms of Zelda games, and only up to a point. <sighs> There's so much more I want to get into here, but hey, spoilers. Look, I, I don't like the ending. I feel it's a little too run in the mill, but maybe that's exactly what you need from this game. Don't let me stop you from enjoying the narrative. There are still plenty of frustrating moments, stupid random situations and tedious time wasting, especially in the early parts of a game, but it's much better once you get into it. Open world and survival games are a pain in the ass and tough as nails until you get the hang of things. And well-designed ones keep you invested without holding your hand through the whole adventure. Things are gonna be tough. It's up to you to pick yourself up and get good enough to conquer the challenges before you. In this sense, the game captures the original spirit of the NES Zelda quite brilliantly. You will get caught in ravines thanks to slippery walls during the rain. You will be confronted by puzzles you can't solve simply due to being out of necessary items. You will find yourself facing enemies you have no hope of defeating, but that's part of the adventure. That's what makes it so memorable. Of course you're not going to be the guardian the moment you zip down from the Great Plateau. These things are genuinely terrifying. They're supposed to be. But it makes for some thrilling and memorable moments. Trying to sneak into an area without getting caught. Dipping between the trees and ruins when you are spotted. How good it feels when you escape. Or how great it feels once you come back prepared to take these suckers down. This game cleverly hides how much there is to do at first. But as you traverse the world, figure out shrines, quests, side missions, characters, enemies. You see just how much there is to do. And how you can use this world to your advantage despite how hard it tries to kill you at times. And considering how vast Hyrule is, well, there's plenty of challenge waiting for you. Seriously, this map is huge. And there are times you will feel it's too damn big. But honestly, when I'm not trying to rush things, I really love it. I remember being a kid when 3D console gaming was still coming into its own, and thinking to myself, man, I just want a game that will let me run around in a field. I wasn't exactly sure why, but probably because that feels great in real life. You one of those people that just needs to be around trees? That loves to go camping? Hell, are you ever driving through a big expanse of land and just have a crazy strong desire to just pull over and run around in a field? Do you love how the sun feels on your face, or wind rushing through your hair, or that peaceful calming silence despite the constant sound of birds, bugs, rustling grass? and trees? Are you one of those people that just enjoys being out in the middle of nature and just existing? This game is basically that. Breath of the Wild is a wonderfully fitting name, and the somber story it tells fits perfectly with this world that's clearly been lived in but long reclaimed by nature. There are so many open worlds that take place in forests, but have a hard time balancing the actual feeling of being out in nature with stupid video game checklists you have to fill out. I like the big open fields. It's calming. It's relaxing. It does a good job feeling like a real place instead of a map that's a bit too conveniently crammed full of crap to do. And climbing is a massive plus. It's not perfect. I mean, it is upgradable, and you do come across methods of traversal that save you a lot of time. In general, it's just nice that it's here. How many big open world games, hell, games in general, 
have you played where you simply can't proceed because of some arbitrary boundary, when in real life, you'd just use your freaking limbs and be over the thing in two seconds? Zelda lets you do that, and while mountain climbing is a bit of a pain, well, it kinda would be in real life. And just the simple fact that you can climb over little walls or cliff faces instead of having to find some stupid path is so welcome. And yeah, I know the Assassin's Creed games exist, but even after 2000 games, they don't feel as natural or as simple as this. Zelda's climbing feels like a game changer for this series. It makes traversal feel that much more dynamic, and it works with everything else making this world feel alive, and makes you feel like you're on a journey, no matter where you're off to. Unlike older 3D Zelda games that give you a brand new weapon halfway through a dungeon, this world opens up the more you understand what's already available to you. Which is why I enjoy the shrines way more than I originally thought. At first, when you have no idea where anything is, when you don't have many methods of traversing between long stretches of land, or great defense against foes, getting to a shrine can be extremely tedious, and then having to beat four of these things and find a goddess statue just to get a tiny bit more health or stamina, it feels like a bit much at first. But all of these shrines are arming you with knowledge. You have everything you need to solve whatever puzzle lays before you. Unless it evolves arrows. I've left shrines early simply because I had no idea how to solve a puzzle, only to come back after plenty of other adventures only to realize that there were simple solutions that could have been solved in two seconds if I had just been a little more creative. All of the tools revolve around the game's physics. Puzzles are normally well designed around them, and the game places enough stuff to conveniently mess with enemies. For the most part, it's a lot of fun. I'm sure you've seen plenty of examples of people discovering weird little details in the gameplay and the interactions with the world itself. I don't want to ruin any of your own fun little surprises, so get out there and experiment. You're gonna have a blast. Even in the cooking, you're gonna have some fun experimenting. Sorting out what ingredients work best together, what dishes you can create, what effects this brand new ingredient you've collected will have with the other bits of your inventory. It's pretty fun, at first anyway. As the game progresses, you will realize just how limited the combinations actually are, and really how useless most of these status effects become as you uncover armor that helps you out with that crap. Still, it's satisfying for what it is, and it is a great way to make some extra cash. Seriously, as tough as it is to get rupees at first, just throw a bunch of meat into a pan and sell it for a ton of money. Really, I don't know why Link is doing all this hero crap. Dude should just open his own restaurant. All this randomness and experimentation is part of the experience. The adventure is your own, and the game provides enough unique moments for each and every player. Even the Master Sword is optional. Yeah, the most iconic weapon in the franchise. The one on the cover, part of the logo, the one they made a statue for in the ridiculously rare Master's Edition. You can go through the entire game without ever seeing this thing. Even if you know where it is, even if you are going after it, this game doesn't make it easy on you. That's all I'll say on that. I'm still just barely scratching the surface here. While I don't think the game is perfect, while I feel it wastes a lot of your time in ways that you will notice, the tedious climbing, the constant rain that keeps you from the tedious climbing, the stupidly fragile weapons, the god-awful motion control puzzles, I mean, yeah, this game has plenty of frustrating moments, but the good far outweighs the bad. And really, the bad is just tiny nitpicking, really. I think the game mostly does a good job justifying its frustrations. And despite being an open world game, it's still brilliantly designed like any good Zelda game by opening up more of the game as your knowledge expands. And there's a great amount of variety throughout the entire game, which is fantastic considering how long you can spend playing it. You'll find new and interesting things to do from the start on the Great Plateau all the way to the end at Lothric Castle. Or, uh, Hy Hyrule. Hyrule Castle. Jokes aside, it is obvious that Zelda has learned a lot from the great games of today. You'll see a lot of Skyrim in this, Witcher 3, The Witness, Dark Souls, and it mixes in all the stuff so brilliantly. And all these little flaws, like I said up front, just make me excited to see what comes next in this series. But regardless of what comes next, regardless of what I'm comparing it to, it's good to see the granddaddy of so many games and game genres take the reins once again and show the world how it's done. It's so strange, isn't it? In a generation that deemed this machine a failure, a machine inferior to the competition, in a market where game publishers throw countless open world games onto every other platform except Nintendo's Wii U, somehow, despite all of this, one of the greatest open world games of this generation is on the Wii U. With its last breath, it gets the last laugh. Now, I'm not going to tell you to run out and pick up an unsupported system, but if you don't have one, and you do find one for a decent price with a stack of games, I don't think you're going to be disappointed. I'm not going to tell you that the Wii U is a smarter purchase than the Switch. I know this video makes it sound like I dislike that new machine, but I really don't. It looks really cool, and I fully intend to get one eventually. Trust me, if they ever make a green one, I'm going to be all over that. I'm just not ready to put my Wii U out to pasture quite yet. It doesn't feel right to toss it aside because Nintendo is dangling a shiny new toy in front of our faces. It made the best of a bad situation and gave us some incredible games through its entire lifetime. We already went over what went wrong. We won't waste our time speculating what could have saved it. 
because hindsight won't save it now. And yeah, maybe dissecting the mistakes can help the Switch avoid the same fate, but I just wanted to celebrate everything it did right. And the Switch is already benefiting from that with one hell of a launch title. Despite my complaints, isn't it kind of amazing that the Wii U gave us arguably its best game at the very end of its life cycle? I start off my time with this machine on the bright, colorful seas of Wind Waker. It seems only fitting that my last grand adventure with the Wii U comes in the quiet and somber Breath of the Wild. And yeah, I've already beaten the main story, but I'm not going to rush this last romp with this little machine. Despite my gripes, despite my complaining, this is still one hell of a great game. And one last reminder that the Wii U, despite its obvious failure, was willing to give us its all right until the end. Before we wrap up for today, I want to take a moment to talk about today's sponsor, Squarespace. Jumping online and building up your own brand was always an intimidating thing for me, but Squarespace makes that a streamlined, fast, and easy process, all while making you look good thanks to their Fluid Engine, a next-generation website design tool that lets you tweak any of their many, many templates with easy-to-use drag-and-drop tools. And I don't need to tell you how useful websites can be, whether you want to build up a portfolio of your work, an art gallery, Gallery or a shop because yes they have everything you need to run your own online business including analytics that help show you the strongest avenues of growth and help you build up marketing strategies which include integration with your favorite social media networks and they can even help you set up an online shop to sell and distribute custom merch all you have to do is design it and they'll handle production inventory and shipping really doesn't get any easier than that and to make it just a bit easier. If you use my link, squarespace.com slash game apologist, you'll get 14 days for free, which is plenty of time to see if this is right for you. And when you want to make a purchase, that same link will get you 10% off your first order. Thank you again to Squarespace for sponsoring the video.